I will try to speak, uh, well, you know, uh, each of us uh, in uh, his or her own way tried to explain uh, the situation in the Russian-American relations and the policies of each country to each other from, from the vantage point of their own area of expertise. And uh, from a historical point of view, from a historian's point of view, I have my own take, which is probably a bit different from what we discussed before. Uh, and, you know, I will start with uh, uh, reminding uh, everybody that the, this wave of the Russia craze in the United States uh, since the Trump election uh, surprised not only Kremlin, uh, but uh, the most, of, most of Russians, including the liberal Russians or anti-Putin Russians, and still uh, seems very overblown. I will not want to discuss the essence of the of this uh, revelation of the scandals or you know, publications in the United States about the uh, Russian interference, Russian hackers, and, uh, Trump's, Trump administration's uh, uh, connections uh, with Russia. I'm just, uh, as a historian, I, I can put it in a you know, longer historical context. And the longer historical context says that uh, every time when the United States got so you know, disturbed by Russia or so, you know, uh, so much interested in Russia and discussing Russia, it was more about the United States than about Russian-American relations or about anything that Russia used to do. <coughs> I will, you know, I, 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 I will ask you to join me for a very brief trip into the history of Russian-American relations, you know, to, to under, I, I, hope you understand what I mean. You know, the very first uh, story when the United States, when American society really discussed the Russia, discussed Russia, discussed what Russia, was Russia a good country or bad country, was Russia uh, well, civilized or uncivilized, uh, happened well, more than two centuries ago, in 1813. It was uh, during the War of 1812. You know, both countries had their own War of, wars of 1812, Russia fought against Napoleon, uh, the United States fought against uh, England. So technically we were on this different side, on, on the different side, but we had uh, just recently established diplomatic relations and the relations between two countries was very normal, let's say. But not, not, uh, the country were very far from each other, no interest actually uh, collided at that time, nothing could Nothing to share, nothing to, to fight for, no bone of contention between two countries ever exist, uh, at that time existed. And uh, what happened in, in 1813? Uh, the part of American society which was uh, opposing the very war against Britain, the mostly the federal, Federalist Party, uh, the merchants of the Northeast from Boston and even uh, New York City, uh, they suffered a lot from the, from the war. And they needed to demonstrate their uh, you know, resistance to the government administration of President Madison uh, conduct of the foreign <coughs> policy. They could not do it by you know, celebrating Great Britain. Of course, it was during the war, it would be very unpatriotic. So they decided to celebrate Russian victories. And they organized several huge uh, dinners, first in Boston, then in Georgetown. Uh, with like several hundred, five hundred uh, participants and the elite uh, of the Federalist and Northwest, uh, Northeastern part of the United States. And th they celebrated Russian victories uh, in order to show President Madison that their dis dissatisfaction on their behavior, on their war. And immediately after that, even before when the plans, the plans were announced for these uh, dinners, uh, the American mass media of that time, American politicians, American journalists, and different newspapers uh, started a clash about Russia. Was Russia a good country and, you could, and Americans would be able to celebrate it? Or Russia was a bad country and the celebration of Russian victories over France or Napoleon would be a bad thing to do? And that, is, that was the first ever uh, American discussion about the uh, mm -hmm. Russian qualities. Was Russia good or bad? And it was not about Russia, it was about American uh, speed, American political speed. And since that time, we had uh, several, I just very briefly, like I mentioned two other uh, instance, instances from the past, because, but believe me, it's much more, much more often uh, happens in the past. The second uh, interesting period was uh, 1870s. 1870s, again, Americans do remember, it was the end of the uh, 
reconstruction of the South and the period of the huge uh, crisis of American identity. The reconstruction of the South ended uh, with the return of segregation or establishing the Jim Crow Crowism uh, in the Southern state, the uh, return of the white uh, elites to the power in the South. And many people ask the question why, uh, why we fought for, what the civil war, what the result of the civil war when the hundreds of thousand uh, people died if we had this, this end of this, this type of the end of reconstruction. So it was a huge crisis which coincided with the President Grant administration who was very unpopular as a president because he was a very corrupt, it was a very corrupt administration and everybody knew that. So, and that was exactly the time when Americans invented the Russia as a country uh, which was even worse. You know, that was a, uh, since that time it was a repeating uh, a mode of speaking about Russia in the United States, that we have somebody who is even worse. And Russia is, you know, in Russia there is a, a Siberia, it was exactly the time when George Kennan, the elder, published his book, uh, Siberia and, you know, Exile and, uh, Exile, Siberian Exile System. And it was a time when Russia was portrayed for the first time in very black uh, tones. Exactly, actually, by, by the time, uh, Part of those people who portrayed Russia from in such in such way were the descendants, literally sons and daughters of, of leading abolitionists, and they use they described Russia as the same uh, language they the parents described the South before the Civil War. So it was a Russia was a country suffering, whereas the good people suffering from the pressure of the bad government, exactly the same way that uh, African Americans suffered in the South before the revolution. That was a portrayal. But again, this was not about Russia. I mean, and those Americans has nothing to do. They never traveled to Russia. They never had any relations that is a commercial or cultural uh, to Russia. They actually needed to reestablish American self-confidence, and they used Russia to say that we are better. We are. And that's exactly the same thing happened a century later, in 1970s. You know why uh, the detente uh, was abandoned by President Carter administration? And also it was strange, you cannot explain it by strategic point of view, because the detente was a real win-win situation. I mean, both Soviet Union and the United States won because of the series of uh, uh, mutual you know, treaties of uh, re-establishing of, of, uh, of trust to each other. And then President Carter came and, uh, and stopped all of that. Well before the Afghanistan. Afghanistan happened only in December 1979, but well before the detente uh, was buried. And what happened? Why it was so? Exactly because the United States was in a deep crisis after Watergate, after uh, the Vietnam War, and after the economic crisis of the middle of the 70s. And that was the time when American presidents had, first Jim Carter, uh, Jimmy Carter and then President Reagan, of course, a uh, major uh, goal was to re-establish uh, American trust, American self-confidence. And to do that, uh, okay, Carter and his advisors probably look around and what was the, well, what, what, uh, what was the only uh, positive uh, story about the United States in the middle of the 70s? What, what Americans could be proud of? They could not be proud of political system after Watergate. They could not be proud of the mighty military after the Vietnam War. They could not be proud of the economic st strength after this uh, economic collapse. Uh, and the only thing which Americans were you know, happy, happy about was the results of the civil rights movement. And, the, and by, the end, uh, by the middle of the 70s, the civil rights movement in the South achieved a significant uh, success. And that was, that's why the uh, agenda of civil, civil rights was projected into the foreign policy into Russian and uh, Soviet American or American Soviet relations. And that was a human rights, appearance of the human rights discourse in the uh, American policy towards the, towards the Soviet Union. And that was a, uh, Carter's, uh, Carter's agenda. Again, not so much. Of course, it, it included the uh, real trouble for the human, human rights for dissidents in Russia. But uh, from the point of view of American society, it was mostly to say that we are still better than the, our major <coughs> Uh, competitor ad uh, adversary in that was. So all of those, you know, and one last uh, like kind of joke or anecdotal uh, story about the Mitt Romney who, in, you remember, all in 2012 told that Russia was a, so, uh, Russia was a traditional uh, 
geopolitical force, something like that. In 2012, it was not about Russia. It was about Barack Obama, of course, because Barack Obama's first term, uh, one of the few results that, uh, of the first term of Barack Obama was the reset policy towards Russia. Barack Obama re-established well, relatively good relations with Russia by 2012. So Mitt Romney criticized not Russia when he said that Russia was a geopolitical force. He criticizes Barack Obama and his policy. And that's how it works in, the, in American society. So again, if you look from this, you know, to century of, of Russian-American relations and to what happens in Russia, in the United States during the last year, it's actually an attempt of American society to cope with the deep crisis of the Trump election. A deep crisis which was, you know, uh, spread uh, through American society with uh, trying to, under, to to explain, trying to explain to, to themselves, to yourselves, guys, uh, why the, why Trump is president. And this is a, a usual uh, usual method of, of solving this internal crisis. Look at the mm -hmm. look at Russia. Trump is an American. Like, Trump is probably Russia. And this is something which uh, you know, which helps. Which is all the rhetoric is ready. All the rhetoric was accumulated for the centuries. So Russia is always uh, something you can you can use to to solve the inter internal home domestic for problems. Okay, I, I'm afraid. I, do I have more time? Yeah, you can take another minute or so. Oh, another minute. Yeah. Okay, so it's. <coughs> So again, this is a critical juncture of American, hist American history. When American identity is put into question, who Americans are? Americans are liberal Democrats or those deplorables, as uh, Hillary Clinton uh, called some, some of the competitors. So, uh, and this is, uh, well, this is a habitual culture of, uh, to use foreign power, Russia, as a scapegoat, as a, you know, to, um, to export to the other uh, that everything that Americans do, do not like at home. And this is how this Russian uh, discourse reappeared during the last year uh, in, in, in the United States. And what is bad is the consequences of this new wave of, of uh, Russian discourse in the United States will have a very long, uh, well, la lasting legacies. Uh, long, uh, after both President Trump and President Putin will be history, the legacy of the current rhetoric will be still poisoning Russian-American relations. The same way that now the civil, uh, the Cold War, the Cold War rhetoric is still poisoning the Russian-American relations right now, and that will be for decades. Thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, so next we have Marlene Laruel of George Washington University, who will be speaking on Russian and U.S. far-right connections, confluence, not influence. Thank you, Henry. So in this paper, I was trying to disentangle the one of the many conspiracy narratives that are be blossoming in the U.S. about Russia being responsible for almost everything happening here in this country, and I was looking at the, the so-called connection between Russia and the U.S. far-right. And of course, that's an important issue because of the Trump's connection with Steve Bannon and because Trump repolarized US public opinion regarding its racist and segregationist past. But what is really interesting <coughs> is that when you try to look at the, this Russia-US far-right connection, they are much more limited than what the media has been portraying. And it's really a good example of a media bubble. You have hundreds of articles about that. When you read all these articles, I don't know if I read the hundreds of hundreds, but I read really a lot of them. You have about 10 facts that you can list, and that's all. And they are very anecdotal, which I will try to, to explain. So there are several elements that I would like to deconstruct here. The first one is, is that it's not because the two presidents in the US and in Russia are promoting so-called conservative agenda value that the far right has been gaining any access to decision-making circles, with the only exception of Bannon's being at the White House for several months and then leaving it. No far right leaders have been kind of empowered in terms of decision making both in Russia and, and in the US. And I think it's important to remember because there tend to be a kind of narrative overlapping far right and conservative, more mainstream politician. What these two presidents, by their narrative or these two political system, have been doing, they have been unleashing some kind of street activism. Charlottesville for the U.S. Matilda, as an example, <laughs> in Russia for 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 the, the recent months. So that's the first point. The second point is that all the media 
and all the comments have been about this alt-right uh, uh, movement being the most kind of visible <coughs> for Russian in the US political spectrum. I think this media visibility, the short one, and they are not so important, they are important for domestic US issues because they are representing <coughs> this kind of revival of white supremacist <coughs> theories under a new cover. But in the bilateral relation with Russia, I think they are much less important than some deeper and more longer trend which are more related to Christian rights and the fact that you have a growing internation internationalization of pro-life and creationist movement coming from the US and kind of creating networks in Russia, in Europe and in the <coughs> Middle East. And I think if there are this, if some connections are important in this kind of ideological world, it's more this kind of Christian uh, radicalism than the pure kind of white supremacist uh, 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 narrative. Third point, uh, yes, many of the alt-right figures are a big fan of Vladimir Putin. They like him for several reasons. They have several disagreements also with him that none of the, none of the two sides try to mm. make too explicit. For example, seeing Putin as a representative of a kind of white world, which is something that Putin would not share. This narrative about kind of race, white race things is not the one that is uh, uh, going on in, in Russia. They would have some disagreement on, on Islam, but then they of course try to present the, the Russia as being exactly uh, in tune with what the alt-right uh, right <coughs> is pushing for. And what is my main point is that it's not because you have kind of mutual admiration on both sides of this US-Russia far right and some shared worldview that you can demonstrate any kind of concrete interaction and even less any kind of Russian influence over that part of the US public opinion. So if we look at the data we have, what we can see, we see that several US far right websites have been republishing, especially Alexander Dugin, because he's the kind of most fashionable and the one you can easily translate in English or he can himself write in English for you, so he is the most kind of publicized. Then we know that Richard Spencer, former wife, is from Russia and she also has been translating Dugin's books and she has been publishing a lot of blogs about uh, celebrating Putin's Russia and Novorossiya. Then we know that some, like two, three white supremacist activists have good connection in Russia with some kind of skinhead group because they were introdu introduced by the former Ku Klux Klan leader David Duke when he was kind of touring in, in, in Russia and in Ukraine. They have been inviting Dugin several times to do Skype lecture because he cannot come in the US because he's under sanction. So it's all about Skype conference in, in some small provincial US universities with like 10 people in the room. They have been, so the Jared Taylor, which is one of the big name of the white supremacy movement because he had this uh, American Renaissance website has been attending the famous 2015 Russian International Conservative Forum in St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. Dugin has been interviewed by Alex Jones and his Infowar website, and then he replicated the, then, so they both mutually interviewed each other. And then we know that the, the ultra-conservative internet channel in Russia, Tsargrad, which has been funded by Konstantin Malofyeyev, the famous orthodox businessman, employed a former Fox News producer who converted to orthodoxy. <coughs> and that's more or less all. So if you put all that together, it's relatively minor connection with relatively small circles of individuals. It's not bigger structure or it's institutionalized interaction. It's uh, mostly around Dugin and some of his friends. It's not connection at a higher level of the Kremlin, which is one of the big difference with the <coughs> Russia's connection with the European far right, which happened at a more state official level with Narishkin and, and so on. With the, on the US side, it's really very marginal with no kind of big figure on the Russian side being involved. Then clearly on the Kremlin side, there is no centralizing force that coordinates all this outreach each <coughs> effort to the Western far right. The topic has been highly divisive and many high level figures in the Russian establishment do not support mm -hmm. that policy. And that policy is clearly in retraction since the last few months, especially toward uh, uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. So, I think if we really want to look at the kind of connection between Russia and the US, then it's more in the business world and the lobbying of big firms that the real issues are. It's clearly not on these kind of marginal far-right groups. And if we want to look at this more ideological 
only the ideological aspect of this connection, then as I said, the Christian right is more meaningful, uh, uh, and which means connection with the Russian Orthodox Church on the Russian side are more meaningful than any of this kind of uh, white supremacist or Dugin type personality on the Russian side. So my conclusion on that is that there is an issue on the way usually uh, uh, Western experts are discussing so-called Russia soft power toward Western public opinion. Because you have different ways of defining soft power. The kind of genuine soft power means that a country is able to shape another country public opinion by shifting its perception and value. I think we have no evidence of anything happening and mm -hmm. Russia hasn't been able to shift uh, uh, perception and values of any other uh, public opinion uh, uh, in the West. What we have is a kind of lighter of power, which is just to follow what, she, what, she, what <coughs> is fashionable or commonsensical in part of the other public opinion to kind of share some agenda and interest. And I think really that uh, it just, in fact, the, the, the Kremlin had been, or even not the Kremlin, but uh, some figure in Russia trying to take advantage of this revival of the uh, uh, US far right to try to partner it, but there is really no influence at the grassroots level, and that's why I was, uh, the, the paper was about like, it's, about, it's not about influence, it's about confluence, because it's not Russia influencing anyone here. It's just some US person and some US and some Russian one sharing a, a, a same agenda. And so I think it's much more important to think about Russia acting as an echo chamber of European and American kind of society's own doubts and transformation and issue than to think that there is any kind of, of a, a direct influence that can be shaped. And I think this kind of media bubble around the US-Russia far-right connection is a good example on how it's important to kind of look at the fact and deconstruct this kind of relationship. I would stop here. Okay, terrific. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, next we'll uh, turn to Alexander Yatsik of Kazan Federal University in Russia, uh, Visualizing the Enemy, Anti-American Propaganda and Russian Anti-Maidan Imagery. So first of all, I'm not sure that my university is very happy that I'm here uh, talking about anti-American propaganda, so I will prefer to be uh, presented uh, as um, a stipendiat of uh, Polish-Russian Center for Understanding and uh, Dialogue in Warsaw, so because I'm living in Warsaw. Uh, just uh, to, uh, to and um, uh, I would like to. Do you remember that little icon that we pushed on the other one? Yeah. Trust me, with this mouse, it's okay. easier to get the big icon. Um, <laughs> I'd like to draw your attention to maybe uh, another part of um, uh, content and no, do not bo more focus on political statements <coughs> or kind of this official stuff and entertain a little bit and, and try to focus on cultural uh, products and uh, those which were produced by uh, uh, so-called patriotic singers uh, in Russia and uh, I would like to uh, be more focused on um, several misconceptions uh, in, in, in Russian discourse and um, uh, focus on um, cultural products of uh, such uh, very important patriotic singers in Russia like uh, um, Night Wolves, White Club, and also Gleb Khamil, who is a, a kind of uh, rock singer in, in, in Russia. So um, I would say that there are four misconceptions about roots and agents of Russian patriotism. Uh, the, the first one is that Russian mainstream patriotic discourse is masterminded and coordinated by the Kremlin only. Um, the, the second one that uh, that Russian cultural background is very <coughs> conservative, and that's why it can be described um, in terms of traditional ideological cliches. <coughs> Uh, the third one is that uh, Russian fighters in Donbass are mostly marginal figures, so light uh, kind of Vatniki, but I would like to uh, say that it's not uh, exactly true. And the, the, the fourth one is that it's mostly the elderly people who tend to support imperial and Soviet nostalgic policies, and that's why it's just uh, enough to uh, wait a little bit and this uh, generation 
uh, will gone and uh, we will have uh, another uh, another <coughs> more democratic one and we will have uh, perspectives is also not true um, <coughs> Uh, my key argument is that uh, the illiberal imaginary of the post-Soviet world uh, reduces, I mean, in, in Russia, uh, reduces the validity of the major pil pillars of international society, uh, like say, state territorial borders, national jurisdiction, citizenship, and uh, legal obligation. And on top of that, uh, Russian performative liberalism puts imaginary concepts such as patriotism, national spirit and pride and natural bonds, defining them in sense of belonging to a trans-border political community named Russia. And the Russian uh, liberalism or liberal, so-called liberal patriotic discourse stems from Russia's traumatic experience of losing empire. So this is my key argument. So if we look at, uh, at, um, at polls, which was conducted by uh, Levada Center in 2016, we see that anti-American feelings in, in Russian society tends to peak when the Russian government perceives geopolitical changes in Europe and Russia's near abroad as threatening Russia's interests in these regions. So we can see that the lowest level of friendly uh, attitudes towards the US was registered in, in 1999 when a NATO campaign against Serbia and Kosovo in 2000. Three, uh, when the uh, U.S. led invasion of Iraq in 2008, um, when Russian Georgia won in August, and in 2018, <coughs> when Yevromaidan and the Ukrainian conflict, conflict in East Ukraine took place. <coughs> and um, the, the second um, diagram also uh, can show uh, <coughs> the same uh, thing, and um, it also based on uh, another opinion poll uh, conducted by Levada Center in May 2016, and it also clearly demonstrates correlation between spikes in public distrust toward countries in Russia's far and near abroad, and major events such again as uh, uh, the relocation of uh, a so-called bronze soldier in, in Tallinn in 2008, as we can see this peak of unfriendly uh, feelings towards Estonia in 2009, um, or Russian Georgian war in August 2008, and one also can see this peak on unfriendly feelings towards uh, Georgia and Ukraine during Maidan revolution in 2013, and the same thing. So, and also Turkey, and we see this uh, Turkey uh, unfriendly peak of unfriendly feelings toward Turkey in 2015 when we have a Russia Turkey conflict. Um, and uh, for many Russians, an apparent irrationality of the military conflict in Donbas can be only explained through this external factor uh, of U.S. influence in Ukraine, for instance, as evidences <coughs> like this uh, by photos of uh, U.S. assistant uh, Victoria Nuland uh, distributing cookies uh, among Maidan activists in February 2014. And this image has been repeatedly repeat reproduced by uh, Russian uh, popular culture, uh, I would say, which crystallizes phantasms and stereotypes of the national consciousness. So uh, another interesting example of this um, anti-Americanism uh, uh, is exemplified by large-scale performances held in Sebastopol since 2010 and organized by the Kremlin patronized <coughs> Night Walls by Club. Uh, interesting that uh, since 2012, uh, Night Walls uh, had about 60 million rubles granted them uh, from president, and uh, they're supported by multi-million ruble grants, and uh, their shows uh, transmitted on the Russian TV channel. Uh, so the shows are the focal points which uh, state-sanctioned geopolitical imagery are uh, manifested um, uh, most loudly. And uh, interesting, uh, this script, this ideological script of these shows, which uh, undergirds uh, these performances, is comprised of Alexander Dugin's uh, Yevrezhnyism uh, and uh, 
also the idea of Catihonia religious uh, messianism. Uh, you can see this uh, very clearly on this picture. And it's lavishly garnished with nostalgia for the <coughs> formal imperial glory. And you can see on this picture a snapshot of the Night Wolves show Fort of Victory, Kuznice Pobiedy, uh, in 2015 in Sebastopol, in which performer holds up the modified state emblem, um, in which hammer and sickle uh, from the Soviet uh, uh, state are replaced by two-headed angle in reference to the Russian Empire with the Christian cross uh, with Jesus in the background. So this is how Russians understand what is Russian idea currently is. Um, and the prominence of the Cold War style anti-American element in this mix speaks of profound absence of ideological alternative to the West being the art enemy. Uh, another picture uh, also clearly demonstra uh, demonstrates this moment of uh, kind of uh, mix uh, different uh, stereotypes and uh, using uh, very old cliches. <coughs> so this moment is highlighted uh, in, in another show, in, in another Night Wolves show, Redemption in 2014, in which U.S. is portrayed as a global evil, as ultimate power master pulling the strings on the global place. Uh, so gigantic hands, as you can see, dangerously hanging on the globe and bleeding Ukraine hard back uh, uh, in time of the familiar Soviet area uh, cliche about the sticky fingers of capitalism, so the Grigushi lap of capitalism. And uh, I, I would say that this geopolitical image can no longer rest on the binary uh, communism capitalism contest because Russia is not, uh, uh, hasn't uh, capitalism anymore, and now Russia has been following the path of the free market capitalism. And in this regard, the heavy use of the Cold War uh, era stock phrases, which occur within the larger anti-Western narrative of this show, shouldn't be confused us into thinking uh, that these efforts are somehow aimed at reviving, uh, reviving the Soviet ideology. Um, another interesting uh, point how uh, anti-Americanism is presented in Russian post discourse is a very corporate <coughs> language. Uh, uh, which is used to, to present uh, the idea of America. I would like to maybe show you a very uh, short uh, video clip to, to, to give you more ideas about that. Um, sorry. Well. <laughs> um, this is um, a song by Bleb Carnil, who is really um, a very uh, a very famous participant of his shows uh, and the song uh, titled uh, America. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> America. seen from this perspective, America is represented as either like a woman in a bikini from resort and, and cruises and top made out of native armor, 
uh, whose irrational behavior is due to her periods and hysteria, or a loser de desperately dreaming about being a macho. And following the logic of his honor, key merits that are supported to demonstrate Russia's superiority over U.S. global leadership ambitions are its vast territory, victory of the Nazis in World War II, and pioneering space <coughs> exploration. So I can say that these three pillars are the, the key pillars of, uh, of current Russian patriotic discourse. And in this context, the, um, the Soviet ideology is replaced by the uh, Russian Orthodox values, which in the past are juxtaposed against West decadent influence instead of Cold War era rotten capitalism cliches. So, um, and uh, despite the uh, Soviet Union collapse, the propaganda employed the Night Wolf bike show uses Soviet year era discursive hands in which Russia is again pitted against the West in the new Cold War. While Russia is not longer Soviet Union, it is still unclear what the current Russian uh, national idea is. And so we have this <coughs> representational uh, trap in national geopolitical consciousness. And uh, I would say that we can explain it uh, from psychoanalytical perspective. <coughs> and if we use this psychoanalytical perspective, uh, Crimea, Ukraine, and Donbass um, as a kind of object uh, whose recapturing promises restoration of an imaginary full identity of uh, the Russian nation. Uh, but uh, since any identity is um, a kind of <coughs> incomplete identity, uh, the construction of new fantasies, for example, about current Russian um, idea, uh, patriotism, becomes uh, an, an inevitable component of popular <coughs> geopolitical aimed at stabilizing the mainstream worldview uh, through the dramatic o o oversimplifications. And um, here, uh, interesting that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, here, the anti-Americanism in the Night Walls show represents a compelling example of how Kremlin uses performances as hybrid policy tools. It's also a very important point because uh, these singers of, uh, so-called singers of patriotism are not only singers anymore. They are uh, fight with guns in their arms and uh, night walls, uh, representatives of night walls uh, by clubs as well as Gleb Karnilov, they are, they are those who fight in Donbass for so-called Donbass uh, Republic. And it also pro promote the idea of independent Donbass Republic, and uh, they are not only kind of uh, kind of singers anymore. And I think that this is an interesting point as how Kremlin uses uh, this uh, cultural point as hybrid uh, policy tools. So um, also interesting that uh, at the same time. Uh, these uh, these singers uh, also kind of uh, civil society, a part of civil society uh, in, in Russia, and uh, focus uh, their message on domestic audience uh, and um, uh, and and probably this aspect of uh, of uh, participation with guns in their arms. Uh, I mean, the representative of this, uh, uh, of uh, cultural producers, producers in, in, in Russia is the most uh, noteworthy aspect of their uh, activity. So I, I would say that uh, these singers kind of uh, the Kremlin's uh, political technologies and uh, the Night Wolves as well as Gleb Karnilov demonstrate how the distance between staging shows and mobilizing people for combat uh, can be very short. It is very also important. So it also shows how easily the imperial aesthetics of widely consumed cultural fantasies can be imported onto a tight knit network of militants. So it is not, not also only about uh, creating fantasies, it's also about implementing fantasies. 
in a very real life. Um, and this is how uh, Russia uh, sees the, uh, its national idea. And, and also, uh, maybe finally said that uh, these guys are not uh, representative of this old uh, uh, generation who grew up in the Soviet era. They are uh, from the new generation, from young uh, people. Uh, they are young people. And they also reproduce their idea of uh, Soviet uh, imperialism or post-Soviet imperialism uh, for their children as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and then our last speaker on the panel will be uh, Sergei Golunov from Kyushu University in Japan. And he, his talk is entitled, We Are Quits Now, Making Conspiracy Theories Normal Again in the Context of Russia-U.S. Relations. Let me start with some uh, <coughs> theoretical points. Uh, first, uh, this is a uh, definition of conspiracy theories. It is an uh, explanation of any events of referring to some secret actions of conspirators who, are, as a rule, pursue evil uh, purposes. Uh, and uh, conspiracy theories, uh, uh, in the most of cases, uh, are represented as something uh, bad as something, uh, as a, a vice uh, and a pathologic kind of thinking that is uh, logically flawed and uh, paranoid. But uh, the problem with uh, this represent, there are some problems with uh, uh, these representations. The first uh, and uh, the most important problem is conspiracies really happen periodically. Second uh, problem is uh, virtually everybody, including myself, resort to conspiracies. Uh, it is, uh, as psychiatrists uh, used to say, that everybody is my patient. But <laughs> it is important not to be, uh, um, not to be uh, have, a, uh, have a difficult, very difficult patient. Uh, the third uh, point is that the log logic of uh, theorizing in social sciences reminds conspiracy theories uh, by some important uh, features. Uh, and uh, taking this into account, uh, some conspiracy studies scholars try to distinguish between uh, acceptable and bad uh, conspiracy theories, uh, warranted and uh, non-warranted, and, uh, and also there is a phenomenon of conspiracyism that is systematic belief in the uh, key and omnipresent uh, role of conspiracies in the historical process. But uh, there is a risk of considering warranted by default uh, those conspiracy theories that uh, blame uh, bad actors uh, and uh, of considering unwarranted those conspiracy theories that uh, blame good actors. For example, uh, Anti-U.S. conspiracy theories uh, can be uh, represented uh, as irrational in the USA, uh, while anti-Russian conspiracy theories can be represented as uh, unwarranted in Russia. It depends on political viewpoint. Uh, and the, uh, the last important theoretical point is functions. Uh, usually, uh, uh, there is a lot of functions that uh, conspiracy theories can play, uh, that is ma making sense of seemingly chaotic reality and providing clear explanation for experienced problems, for example, of Trump's victory. Uh, empowering uh, conspiracy theorizers and uh, disempowering uh, the opponents. Uh, mobilizing support of conspiracy for conspiracy theorizers. Uh, providing popular and uh, profitable entertainment plots. <laughs> Uh, and here are some uh, historical trends. Uh, 
uh, just in brief, uh, here are some Russian trends uh, before Peter the Great foreigners uh, uh, were represented as defiling agents of devilry. Uh, uh, after that, uh, things uh, became uh, more mild. Uh, foreigners uh, represented as foreign uh, spies. Uh, Jews uh, were represented as secret organization uh, who tried to seize uh, power. Germans uh, were represented as the fifth column. Uh, and uh, in, uh, Soviet, uh, in the Soviet period, uh, Foreigners, uh, foreign in, foreigners uh, were represented, uh, foreign influence, uh, foreign evil influence was represented uh, as uh, uh, the network of spies uh, trying to undermine uh, Soviet order by various means. And if in post-Soviet period, conspiracy theories rise and uh, got more diverse, diversified. Uh, uh, Western agents are still here. Uh, um, the USA is uh, definitely the uh, conspired, conspiring actor number one in Russian conspiracy theories. Uh, and the uh, adjacent state uh, who uh, allegedly tried to seize some Russian territory uh, are conspirators, uh, conspiracy actors number uh, two, three, four, etc. And here are some American trends. Uh, before the 20th century, uh, century there were some uh, alleged networks of Masons, Catholic and capitalist, capitalist oligarchs. Uh, from the World War I, uh, there were two Red Scares and also some other uh, mm. malicious actors. Uh, and uh, um, in the late Soviet period, uh, conspiracy theor theorizing in the USA uh, tended to shift uh, towards some uh, global conspiracy theorizing, some uh, global forces. Uh, suppose allegedly trying to subdue or seize uh, the USA with the help of uh, UN forces, for example. And uh, uh, global secret organizations uh, probably prevail now, but Russian scare is here in uh, this decade, here again. Uh, these are some recent developments. Uh, uh, in Russia, anti-American rhetoric has been particularly prominent since uh, the last electoral cycle, uh, since 2011-2012 uh, electoral cycle. Uh, it is about disempowering of uh, pro-American supposed uh, alleged fifth column uh, that is used as uh, a major pretext for crackdown on civil liberties and also to legitimize Putin's regime, rely its supporters, and uh, to boost uh, ratings of uh, anti-Western and anti-opposition revealing, so-called revealing uh, documentaries. And uh, at the same time, it is interesting that uh, Russian-Chinese uh, rapprochement disempowers anti-China conspiracy theorizing. Uh, again, uh, China is conspiracy actor number two after the USA. Uh, in the USA, uh, Russian annexation of Crimea induced some local fears among Alaskan population that Russia can uh, repeat uh, this Crimean scenario. And uh, especially during the, and after the presidential campaign, uh, alleged Russian connections of Donald Trump have become, became, uh, become a target for his political op opponents seeking to disempower the president. So uh, American uh, conspiracy of theorizing uh, uh, current uh, America's uh, anti-Russian conspiracy of theorizing, uh, it looks that uh, it is uh, at first about disempowerment. Uh, some uh, accusers, uh, while some uh, this uh, conspiracy theorizing uh, can have its ground, uh, but conspiracy, conspiracism, heavy conspiracism sentiments are still here. Uh, Trump uh, that portray. Trump is a Russian puppet and frame Russia as nearly omnipresent force trying to destroy the very U.S. democracy. It is conspiracism. <coughs> and it is interesting that now uh, both Russia and USA uh, employ anti-conspiracy rhetoric actively. Normally in the post-Soviet period, uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, Mainstream discourse was uh, more rationalistic in this respect that r when Russian one, uh, Russia, uh, Russian conspiracy theorizing moves uh, were framed as absurd and paranoid. But now both sides use uh, 
nearly the same rhetorics. They uh, develop, uh, they employ, well developed uh, anti conspiracy rhetoric to dismiss uh, opponents' claims. For example, uh, recently Vladimir Putin and uh, other Russian high standing politicians, for example, uh, Lavrov, Zakharova, uh, who are proficient in conspiracy theorizing themselves, uh, concurrently show uh, their proficiency in dismissing US conspiracy theorizing using some uh, rhetorical devices such as pointing to the lack of evidence and uh, to availability of alternative explanations, accusing advocates of conspiracy narratives uh, of uh, pursuing uh, unscrupulous political interests, what aboutism, a reduction of uh, absurdum and irony, uh, politicization and uh, denigration of uh, proliter US proliterators. And here come uh, conclusions. Uh, first, uh, uh, in the contemporary Russian-US relations, conspiracy theorizing about external enemies uh, gradually becomes a mutually enforced normality rather than a bad manner. Uh, however, conspiracy theorists still do, play, uh, do not play equivalent roles in US and Russian politics, uh, especially from the functional point of view. In both countries, conspiracy theorizing is currently used, uh, used for delegitimizing political opponents, but in Russia, both functions are more prominent, and uh, that is more important. Uh, in Russia, conspiracy theorizing is heavily used for authoritarian regimes' self-legitimation, and in some cases for mobilizing supporters, while uh, American conspiracy theorizing is, first of all, about delegitimizing. And uh, here are some uh, pictures. Uh, that one, uh, the below, uh, that one uh, that is below is about uh, the most recent uh, genetic weapons conspiracy that the U.S. Uh, allegedly uh, collects uh, uh, genetic samples of Russian to uh, invent some uh, biological weapon that uh, um, directed uh, against Russians selectively. Thank you very much. Uh, so our uh, speakers were all very attentive to uh, timing considerations, so we actually have about uh, 20 minutes for discussion. So um, let me just collect maybe a few uh, questions or very brief comments for the speakers to react to. So the floor is open. Uh, yes, please. Yes. Maybe you can just identify yourself, please. Oh, certainly. My name is Robert Stepanek. I'm a journalist uh, and a polemicist, I guess you could say. But uh, the question relates to uh, the connection between the alt-right and the Russia, as, as well as the uh, anti-Maidan and anti-American propaganda. And it seems to me that the issue that you have is, that may be a genuine connection rather than uh, a, a sur a surmounting a false connection between the right and Russia is one of identitarianism. Because if you read the alt-right, Generally, uh, there, there's not necessarily a, a unanimity position, but identitarianism is an aspect, and certainly Russia and Putin has uh, drawn upon identitarianism with Russian identity also, the idea of the greater Russia and, and the transnational Russian community. Um, the other issue that generally animates the alt-right, I would say, is separatism rather than supremacism. And so there I think there may be a gulf between the two, that there's more Russian supremacism that animates uh, the transculturalism that, that they're pursuing, whether it's the greater Russia, the Borussia, that sort of thing. And, um, that, 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 and I think the other aspect of the right identifying with uh, Russia is, has to do with the fact that most quote unquote white nations or the Western nations are aggressively pursuing policies of multiculturalism. We've certainly seen this with all these refugees flooding into Europe. Whereas Maybe Russia, briefly, sorry. Okay, so, sorry. sorry just, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. just about finished. Whereas Russia's uh, uh, position not one so of multiculturalism, but more maybe transculturalism emerging from the Soviet Union. So, just some ideas to throw out there. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes. Kim. Um, my question is for Alexandra. It was a fascinating presentation, and um, I'm sort of channeling here Janet Johnson, who isn't here, but she has done um, some work recently on uh, on Putin's masculinity and on how um, you know the masculinity is, is a part of you know, sort of the whole um, uh, ideological basis for how Putin presents himself. 
And I, I'm just wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about the, the presentation of the United States as being the woman in this, in this video clip. Do you think that that was particularly tied to Hillary Clinton? Um, or is there some, you know, to use the language that, that feminist theorists might use, is there some other trope that's being uh, called upon here? Why would this have such a great uh, resonance among the Russian population? Okay, good. Uh, I like uh, to ask Ivan, I do like his approach very much. And so my, my question is whether any other countries like France, for example, play, played the same role of scapegoats, or if you are a specialist in Russian-American relations, could you please find symmetrical things when uh, for Russia, the United States played a similar role? Uh, one more question to Marlene. Uh, 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 I'm a little bit, uh, uh, well, surprised by the fact that Dugin uh, was uh, welcomed here by somebody with his position, which is uh, anti-American anti position. So uh, what, uh, uh, what, what were the reasons uh, for them to invite him? And uh, just a two words about uh, Alexander's presentation. I would not say that this is propaganda. Uh, I've seen recently the movie one was uh, commenting uh, on Russian-American relations, uh, military, between military, it was extremely positive with regard to about 19th century uh, Russian-American uh, relationship, and these are marginal. So you can find uh, several impressive images uh, of persons who uh, never were uh, any, any, anyhow popular, and it's understandable that if uh, the United States are considered to be the enemy by 70-80% uh, of Russians, some of them uh, do use this and do exploit these feelings, but uh, do you think this is really propaganda, or this is just like, say, you can find something anti-American, something, something anti-Russian, something anti-whoever? Okay, yeah, that's one more, and then we'll take around and ask people to be brief, and then we'll open it up. Um, well, I'm very glad that you characterized the uh, Russian control of the U.S. election as a conspiracy theory, because it, it is really uh, quite a wild theory, particularly if you ignore the fact that Hillary Clinton ran a really lousy campaign <laughs> and was connected with that faction of the Democratic Party into the Wall Street <coughs> Democrats. It's a big issue now uh, within the Democratic Party with people who oppose their economic policy and the war policy including regime change, which has been pretty devastating. So I, uh, you know, I wanted, I, I was glad that you did this, and I wonder why the actual question of what happened in the American election is not considered when people discuss it, and the assumption is just that there had to be something done about Trump, and ignoring the other side of what actually happened in the election. Okay, let's see, I did, how many hands do we have up? Okay, I guess we have two more. Maybe let's just go ahead and take those and then we'll give the rest of the time to the speakers. And if we have a little extra time, we can take more. So if Josh and the gentleman in the back again. <laughs> okay, so I have a, a question for Alexander and then a kind of comedy question for Marlene. So Alexander, I wonder if you could just speak a little bit to how we kind of link up the images you've shown us here and the discussion you give us of a sort of anti-Americanism among Russian youth with the images and the examples of the, of the protests, the sort of Navalny protests that took place in March and June, which were heavily oriented around young people, and how we should think about the kind of overlap between those two. Like, so are we seeing a sort of bifurcated divide within Russian youth where you're either pro-Putin or you're anti-Putin? Or are these things actually overlapping? Where, and this is sort of Navalny's thing, that you can be anti-corruption at the same time that you can have a kind of pro-patriotic, anti-US attitude. So I'd love to hear just a little bit about more about how those kind of fit together. And then Marina, I just want to ask the question, and we can talk more about this later, but that I think one link potentially between the alt-right in the United States and what's going on with the Russian government is may not have to do with direct links in terms of collaboration, but might actually have to be more of a kind of technological link of using and copying tools, right? And so some of the tools that the Russian government had developed within the context of Russian domestic politics, such as trolling and bots and these sorts of things on the internet, these kinds of tools which allow the government to sort of try to control the tenor of discussion online, engage, you know, shape the discussion online, I think are tools that may have been picked up 
by the far right to amplify, uh, to sort of amplify their message and allow a smaller group of the population to appear larger in the online conversation. So it's, it's more of a comment than a question, but this might be another interesting area to sort of look at these kind of links here, especially if it turns out that there are like some very direct technological links here. So it may not be ideas necessarily being shared so much as tactics. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. story now on Morris. There's a counter tradition to us being in awe of Russia. I mean, you know, boy, did they pull a fast one with selling Alaska. Man, they're sharpies. We're not too bright. Wow, look at those novels. Man, we can't compete with these writers. That's you know, moving up this century. Man, look at them dumping out these refugees we're getting. Poor people. Are Man, it's like this uh, Cuban thing. They're taking advantage of us. They're, wow, they dominate world chess until Bobby Fischer. Their mentality is, wow, must be a little sharper than I. And they have every spy in every department of FDR's government. Incredible people. I can't believe it. Man, we're all pictures. It's a kind of tradition to the... Uh, you know, fall guy, Russia. It's the Superman. Russia. <laughs> okay, well, great. So um, maybe let's just start with Yvonne and then go in the order that people are sitting at the table. And um, maybe about three minutes each, two to three uh, okay. <coughs> ish. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nikolai. Uh, well, I have less to say about France, but still, I will, I will probably try with uh, start with Napoleon, who. Uh, Okay, already in the St. Helens Island uh, once told that in 20 years uh, Europe will be either Republican or Cossack, meaning either Americanized or Russianized. <laughs> and for, you know, for Europe, for, for France in particular, for Europe, for at least since Napoleon, uh, to be Europe is uh, meant to be like between two extremes, and two extremes were represented by Russia and by the United States. But this is a kind of a popular geopolitics, which is as for a Russian use of, of, uh, of course, Russia use it, uh, use the United States the same, sometimes the same way that Americans use it. But the most recent uh, example was after the 2011-2012 uh, public protest, when actually the state used, uh, well, you know, it was a very simple uh, invention or non revitalization of the idea that all the opponents of opposition are somehow connected to the United States and the United States is an evil demonic country which uh, you know, plotting against uh, you know, the very heart of the Russian uh, Russian soul and this is this two means you know you cannot just link the opposition to America without demonizing the United States because you know if the United States is a good country what better to be you know linked to the United States and so it's it, it, it went together. And by the way, this is interesting that after Trump came to power, still with all of the deterioration of the relations, with all of this ex mutual expel expellation of diplomats, <coughs> the Russian propaganda is not as bad about uh, America as it used to be. I mean, that, and that actually is some hope to, to part of the liberal opposition, because without demonizing America, well, the regime is maybe less uh, tough against the political opposition, which is an interesting coincidence. But well, but uh, Russian view on America is more complex because uh, for Russia, America was always a uh, significant other since the 19th century, you know, decembrists who used American constitutions for, for as a model. And, and Russian, uh, well, to, to, to make it simple, uh, Russian views on America is going cycles, you know, the cycles from uh, when Russia is in the ref reformist part of its cycle, when the Russian government, the Russian society wants to reform the country, uh, the United States immediately appears as a model, as a pattern, as something to, to, to draw the good lessons. And this is for several times, and it's, you know, uh, for technocratic or for revolutionary is the same. Like for technocratic Nicholas I, the uh, United States was a source for engineering, innovations, railroads, telegraph. And for reform, well, revolutionary disembrists, the uh, United States was a source and model for constitution. And for Bolsheviks in the 20s, uh, the United States was a model. For Khrushchev, Gorbachev, and even Medvedev, uh, the United States was a, repeatedly the model. And, and for every time that when Russian cycle went to the uh, another another part of its cycle to the freezing to you know to. To the, when the regime wanted to hold on and to free the society, the United States immediately turned to be a threat and to be a foe. And it was all the time. Again, we can start with the 19th century, it's repeatedly, repeatedly the same. And so, 
this is you know it's a little bit little bit more complex because for Russia America was always a part of its uh, you know parts of the internal domestic debates. In the United States there were periods of time when Russia wasn't like you know previous decades for instance, but the United States continued to be to be the major. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. So one minute uh, question, <laughs> Josh, uh, Josh uh, it's, a, it's a good point, I haven't worked on that. I would think that the kind of cyber tool that Russia is using are more coming from the kind of advertising marketing world mm -hmm. than from the far right. I think they are more looking at that and how to use that. But well, I the other way, the other way that the far right in the US, the alt right in the US has actually learned from what <coughs> Oh, that the tools that Russians developed over the last four or five years in cyber, in online media. Mm, yeah, well, I don't know. I would think that the far right has been having long time strategy, I mean, has been building its own strategy to amplify its own narrative since, I mean, b before Russia uh, uh, played with, with cyber tools. But what is sure is that on the, the, the construction of the conspiracy, there are a lot of interchanging element and clearly a lot of Russian conspiracy theories are originated in the West the same way as the one in the Middle East also originated in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Kolya, the question on Dugin. Dugin, he, he has multiple identities and he can play on multiple kind of uh, uh, narrative. The narrative that make him legitimate here <coughs> is not the narrative about Eurasian geopolitical opposition to the US. It's a narrative about white identity kind of Aryan, Hyperborean, neo-Nazi, you know, all this kind of mythology that resonates with some of the white supremacists here. And so there, there is a kind of conflict because it's, it's much more pro-Muslim than what white supremacists are here. So he has this kind of double uh, uh, identity, the kind of white uh, uh, product to sell here and the other one. And what also makes the connection is that his anti-US, anti-NATO narrative goes resonate well with the anti-federal state of this white supremacy. So that's the same kind of narrative that Washington, all these federal state, they are not real Americans, it's all Jewish. So, so on that, they can share this part also of the narrative. And on the, the first question about identitarianism, there are some identitarian people in, in Russia, some far right thinker. I don't think Putin can be considered as an identitarianist. Because identitarianism, as it has been constructed in the US and, and it's originated from France, it's very much based on race. It's very much anti-empire. While <coughs> Putin's narrative is really not based on race, it's really much more pro-imperial than anti-imperial. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's anti-multiculturalist in the Western sense, but it's in favor of kind of common destiny of several of the nations of the Eurasian space. So it's not anti kind of interaction between different cultures. On the contrary, it's built on the narrative like dialogue of civilization and culture that, that Russia represents. So I don't think we can make that connection with the Putin's regime and this kind of identitarianism uh, narrative in the West. Thank you, Sergey. Okay, okay uh, concerning uh, Russian uh, interference uh, into the U.S. election, my point was uh, not about uh, denying it, uh, but about not uh, going too far and not falling into uh, conspiracism. Uh, it is important to stop uh, at some point and uh, to consider alternative explanations properly uh, and uh, to, for example, to uh, respond to questions uh, about to what extent Russian influence really shaped the result of to what uh, extent Russian connections uh, do really matter. Uh, and uh, uh, if some stresses uh, point of uh, with Russian interference into US elections uh, too firmly, uh, uh, one uh, will have probably will have to deal with uh, what aboutism. Uh, uh, can you be sure that uh, the USA never tried itself to meddle into Russian elections? Uh, the outcome of, uh, of it uh, is uh, probably modest, but uh, if, you, uh, if you ought to fight a presumption of guilt, uh, it will be difficult to dismiss it. <laughs> Okay, to, to Kim uh, about Hillary Clinton, so I'm not very well known uh, about uh, her images in Russia, but um, uh, during the election, 
hackers also used uh, the same uh, things uh, in terms of representing uh, her. So, for instance, uh, in October, uh, they uh, posted on her uh, on, on her pages in, in Wikipedia uh, kind of porno content, and uh, with with comments um, uh, about that if uh, she will be elected, uh, she would be elected. Uh, the nuclear war is unavoidable, and uh, her husband will uh, continue to rape women, etc. So it means that. Uh, uh, the opponent, uh, especially if it is a woman, also represents a kind of uh, as, as a very weak candidate because of woman, and also kind of irrational uh, candidate uh, with a very uh, hysterical candidate, etc. So, I mean, this gender-focused uh, narrative is very much used uh, in, in this sense as well. Uh, so, to to Nikolai about marginal figures, I don't think so because, as I mentioned. Uh, I just use this example to, I mean, this clip to, to show you because, uh, how America is represented because it's very, um, I mean, elucidate how, how it is. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, Gleb is a, a constant participant of this bike show, which is supported by a uh, president, uh, by Putin, is uh, multi uh, milliard uh, shows, which is translated uh, by the first channel. So, I mean, these are not marginal figures if I uh, participate in, in these shows. Uh, and also very interesting question maybe to Artemi, why, for instance, old rock stars participated also in this show, like, uh, for instance, Kipelov or uh, Botusov. So they are also participating in the show. So it's a very interesting question, why? And uh, about uh, images of Navalny uh, protest, I think that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, they are not overlapping, actually, because they are representing, they use different tools for uh, representing uh, Russia. So in case of Navalny, they're trying to use this so-called liberal imagery, um, which are about, which appealing to the ideas of uh, national borders, uh, corruption, I mean, kind of rational ideas. Uh, on national uh, jurisdictions, <coughs> citizenships, law, etc. But in terms of uh, this uh, uh, patriotic discourse, as I said in, in the beginning of my presentation, they use uh, such uh, kind of uh, terms as uh, national spirit, uh, bonds, natural bonds, or uh, patriotism, um, and this is kind of irrational uh, terms or concepts which we can explain uh, with using of toolkit of these uh, liberal um, liberal concepts, and uh, this is difference between them. Okay. Um, well, uh, please join me in thanking our panel. So we'll now have a, about a 45 minute session just for general uh, discussion about uh, you know, themes related to the year after Trump's election. So we'll just uh, invite, I guess, Josh to come up here to the front and our other panelists, uh, other than Marlene, Marlene can stay. Uh, if anybody needs a minute to get a drink or something, we'll start up in just a, a minute or so. So our plan for this final session was not to actually make people sit around for another hour and, and listen to <laughs> presentations here, but just given the fact that we had so many presentations on the schedule and we were limited in the amount of time that we had, and also given the, the sense that there are, you know, unlike certain conferences, there are some sort of overarching questions that we're asking here, and so there's a, a lot of chance to sort of draw connections across the panels. 
So our thought was we would just save a little bit of time at the end of the day to have a general discussion um, about some of the themes that were raised today and give people a sort of chance to weigh in collectively on things that they've, that they've learned about today or thought about today or, and things like that. So that's by way of saying two things. One, if we're all exhausted, we don't have to go to 6 o'clock. On the other hand, if the conversation is fascinating, we have the room and we can continue to go for a while. Um, and second of all, I wanted to give Henry a chance, who hasn't uh, spoken today, to, to sort of kick us off on discussion and, and offer some, in, some opening thoughts on this. And <laughs> you may have a few things that you want to add at this point as well. So. Okay. I mean, do you want to go? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, so I want to thank everybody for a really fascinating discussion. Um, so I thought I'd just offer a few kind of starting reflections, sort of building on uh, Josh's great introductory comments. And uh, I mean, I think kind of one of the takeaways that come away from this discussion is, uh, you know, that we're in fact facing a very dangerous time uh, with a lot of hostility, both the elite and mass level, um, you know, among not just the United States and Russia, but involving Ukraine as well and policymaking circles. Um, and that uh, we have world, we have conflicts throughout the world that put us in a very dangerous situation. And so we're in a very serious problem, or in a very serious situation. Um, and it's both a good thing and a bad thing for us as analysts. Uh, you know, primarily the presenters are social scientists, and we're much better at explaining the causes of things and explaining the complexities uh, you know, than we are really at identifying, well, okay, how do we get out of this situation um, productively? So um, you know, I had a lot of takeaways uh, on terms of the, uh, you know, situation that we're in. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I think maybe some of the good news that comes out of this is, uh, you know, I don't see anybody saying that sort of, uh, you know, the, the leaderships of both countries are, you know, determined to bring us into uh, nuclear war or, you know, I think there's, there's sort of a desire for some kind of peaceful solution uh, on all sides. Um, but there are a lot of problems um, which theories of international relations suggest are actually quite formidable and dangerous um, that we have to address. And of course, the biggest one probably is just, well, okay, peace is great, but peace on whose terms, right? I think both sides would love a peace in which their own interests are recognized. Um, and what we have is a situation, even you know, st setting aside questions of which side is right and which side is wrong, um, you know, of, of two sides uh, being willing to accept a, a high degree of risk of conflict um, a further conflict uh, to get its version of a somehow you know peaceful uh, settlement, um, and this we might not have arrived at the situation in a in a cautious manner, um, but at least that seems to be the situation that we're in, and the reasons that are brought by each side seem somehow um, incompatible, which I think makes it particularly difficult. Um, a second uh, problem, which I see coming out of a lot of the presentations, is that there are uh, forces within each country. Um, some that prefer some kind of moderation, um, but a lot of them actually may have some interest in escalation uh, for one reason or other as the way to go forward. Um, so on the Russian side, uh, you know, we heard uh, you know, Kim Martin's presentation about you know, the possible interest that uh, Shemezov and others might have an interest in arms sales promotion, which could be uh, an interest in, in conflict. Um, uh, at the level of public opinion, uh, leadership might have an interest in, in conflict to generate rallying around the flag effects. Um, and on the United States side, um, you know, there's a, a widespread opinion among a lot of people that uh, you know, certain actions of the Russian Federation uh, are intolerable and uh, you know, therefore need to be resisted and, and punished. Um, and uh, making it even uh, you know, more complicated is that it's unclear even what that policy is sometimes. Um, so there's a certain sense in which there are a number of, of two-level games going on. Um, and Public opinion, moreover, seems to be uh, not a strong constraint uh, towards either side. I think that's an area which will be interesting to debate, but it seems, at a minimum, somewhat manipul manipulable on both sides, impacted by uh, partisanship, you know, lenses of partisanship, how one interprets international affairs. Um, so basically, we have sort of two-level games, you know, leaders that are both engaged in battling with the battles within their own elites, negotiating with public opinion. At the same time, they're negotiating with others in unpredictable um, environments where you have very serious um, differences. Uh, and so, uh, you know, and I think some of these differences seem to be, you know, deeply rooted in interests. Um, others might be uh, related to values. Um, so, uh, and I guess I would say, you know, further complicating things, uh, you know, it would be nice, uh, as I think kind of uh, 
uh, Vladimir Dubovic kind of hinted at earlier uh, that, uh, you know, to just be able to talk about U.S.-Russian relations, but, um, you know, as, as he observed, and as I think many of the presentations here uh, indicated, uh, you know, you, you can't talk about that without including other actors that are directly affected and are effectively veto players. It's sort of a standard axiom of internet, you know, like negotiations theory that you have to have all the major veto players uh, involved in order for a, a legitimate solution. So, you know, we need to have Ukraine, Ukrainian, Ukrainians at the table, especially, you know, when it re regards the conflict uh, on Ukrainian territory. Um, you know, then you have the European Union and, and others involved. And all this just makes it extremely uh, complicated. Um, you know, because when you have all these uncertainties and, and incoherences and, and interlocking problems, uh, uh, it seems like they're, they're, it's very difficult to, to change certain things. So it seems like, like Russia's unlikely to give up Crimea, uh, Ukraine, the US, and most of the West are likely not to accept it in the future. Um, sanctions seem quite likely to be sticky, uh, at a minimum for political reasons, uh, even apart from uh, I, I, whether people think they're justified or not. Um, and regime change also seems unlikely in, in, in the countries involved. Um, so, uh, you know, in that light, I was kind of looking in the memos for different possible solutions that people have advanced. And uh, in fairness, that was not the, the objective. Like, we didn't ask people for this. And I know people in their other work have had, uh, you know, like whole reports proposing different ways forward. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, but it's interesting that kind of the, you know, the, 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 the impetus is to focus a lot on the problems and there don't seem to be any strong solutions and, and the solutions that are suggested are often point in different directions. You know, some uh, seem to imply that, well, maybe removing sanctions is relatively ineffective, uh, you know, or uh, counterproductive might be the way to go uh, to develop other kinds of transformative economic interests. Um, but on the other hand, uh, others would argue that the West needs to take measures to demonstrate resolve, um, augmenting sanctions, arming Ukraine further uh, in order to, to force uh, Putin to the negotiating table, um, which could ultimately provide a, uh, a resolution. Um, influencing public opinion in both countries seems difficult to do in a systematic manner, although you know, everybody tries to do it as we, as we can. Um, and uh, you know, there's even dispute on kind of where we really have areas of genuine common interest, especially when it gets complicated. You know, maybe at the abstract, the national level, we can think about interests against counterterrorism. But you know, once you break down, if you, if you conceive of foreign policy as, as being about competing elite, elite interests, maybe even that becomes difficult. Uh, which isn't to say we shouldn't advocate for that, but um, I think kind of the you know the question you know that I would sort of be interested in people's thoughts among other things is uh, you know kind of what are the areas that uh, you know some kind of positive movement forward uh, you know could be had, um, and and is it not you know would it not be the case that maybe the best we can do is basically just kind of wait it out um, you know focus on trying to make things not get worse on these areas of of, of kind of deadlock. Um, you know, which would involve things, concrete policies like maximizing communications among the sides, exchanges, uh, you know, between students, professionals, what have you, military to military contacts, visa openings, um, and I, again, I'm not talking just Russia, U.S., but, you know, Ukraine, uh, you know, what have you, kind of pushing for those sorts of things, um, and maybe just hope that time will produce some new con contingencies, especially thinking over the decade. Um, I want to think that that's not the best solution, but uh, I, I did want to toss that out there. So. Yeah, just very briefly, two very kind of very modest, limited comments, and that are kind of following what what Henry was saying. The first one is, of course, this kind of elephant in the room about <laughs> uh, um, the 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 U.S. perception and the the place of Russia in the U.S. domestic context since last year. And, and so I was wondering how do we think scholars should deal, should, can work in this kind of environment, which I found really kind of oppressing. How do we want to be part of that discussion and feel we need to be involved or we consider we cannot be involved because that's happening at a level that is kind of too far away from, from academic production. So level would be how do we want to study what is happening and in that case it means that as a Russian expert we are suddenly also trying to look at US domestic issues and and I was I don't know if I'm saying it too boldly or, or but I was surprised to see not so many kind of large discussion about academic community on Russia about what is going on here about Russia 
And so I was wondering if that has also to do with the fact that the, the, the political culture of the Democrats has been shifting so much since last year about Russia, and the fact that the majority of the academia would be more on the Democrat side than on the Republican, that suddenly created difficulties for between <laughs> being a scholar and being a citizen and trying to identify which kind of role uh, Russia has been really playing and how do we want to study what is happening uh, here, uh, not only on the Republican side, but now also on the Democrat side. And the second <coughs> element, which is also kind of following what Henry was saying about Ukraine, but I would make it bigger, is that when we are discussing Russia, US-Russia relations, I always have a kind of surge of my European identity and I always <laughs> feel like, well, you know, it's not bilateral issues and it's not only trilateral with Ukraine. There should be probably more about Europe, not only in terms of us acting more with European scholar, but also how do we want people, US scholar working on Russia, knowing more about what is happening in Europe to be able to put Europe in their picture of trying to understand Russia. Because my impression is that very often the, the, the knowledge about the European public opinion in all their diversity about Russia is relatively low and that may kind of black and white perception while if you integrate the European perspective it makes things largely more complicated and in a sense I think that should really be part of the discussion. That's all. Okay. Um, Thanks. I, so I had a chance to speak at the beginning, so I'll, I'll just, I just want to make two brief points and then toss it open for discussion. Uh, a couple of observations. One is that I have been struck by the fact that there was so little discussion of North Korea today. Other than I think it was Vladimir who had a throwaway line early on who said, well, in a couple of years, the Korean Peninsula is going to be reunified. So now we all know. Right. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious on how that's going to come about. but. Um, I do, I do want to raise this because, again, when I sort of threw out, oh, and to explain the, the English uh, the metaphor I used earlier today, or the expression, the dog that caught the car, for those of you who are not familiar with this expression, it's that dogs chase cars all the time, right? So there's this whole thing where dogs are always running around after cars, and then people will say, well, what would the dog actually do with the car if it actually caught it, right? So we have this expression in English, the dog that caught the car, is like if you're trying to get something and then suddenly you get it, you don't know what to do with it, right? So that was <laughs> the idea there. And I do think that, you know, that when we, that, and again, we haven't really talked too much about this, about, you know, weakening NATO and what Trump may have done to the NATO commitment. And there were things in the first couple of months that when Flynn was still, or first few days when Flynn was still in office that looked more likely in the aftermath of that in the pre-McMaster's tape. But nevertheless, there is a question to be asked about as much as there's been a long-term uh, you know, that Putin has this, you know, sort of the Putin's Kremlin has this, or at least Putin 2.0 has this, you know, real retribution to weaken NATO in response to Ukraine, in response to lots of other things, you know, this long-running thing, about whether Russia's real threat comes from the West today, and whether weakening NATO so that Germany doesn't decide to invade Russia is the big issue, as opposed to instability coming from the East. Um, and, and it was interesting talking about the fewer conspiracy theories about China, hearing a bit about that today in the final talk, in the final talk of the day, again, you know, contrasting this with the sort of long-term concerns about demographics within Russia and China and the Chinese in the eastern part of Russia and what's happening in these kind of long-term things. And, and so I, I am kind of curious about, about the Korean Peninsula and how this kind of relates to the story that we've talked a bit about today. Because this does seem, if we're going to throw around nuclear war, right, we're not thinking really the Russians and Americans are going to start lobbing nuclear weapons at each other. Whether the well, there's going to be things lobbed over North Korea is another matter entirely, right? And what does that mean for Russian security? I mean, it's a country that, you know, it's, it's, in, its, it's in its backyard. So I think that's one thing I might, I might be interested in hearing more people's thoughts about right now. And then I just want to push on one thing, which actually was in the very first talk of the day, so to give us some circularity here, about what our party was, say, our party was saying about the Trump euphoria. And I was kind of struck by that talk, which sort of got exactly to, the, again, this question of that I was raising in the very beginning about these images of the Russian Duma clapping. And then, and then you know, it came out that Russia was actively working to try to help Trump get elected. And this question that I raised in the beginning about this sort of, so what does that mean for, for the Kremlin's ownership of the Trump administration? And I felt like a lot of the talk that went on today 
and 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 even in particular, and even in Henry's remarks now with the sort of pessimism about how things are are difficult between the countries and everything like that, and and that that there's just been this shift back to saying, oh, okay, it's easy to just from within the context of Russian domestic politics. That's what I want to talk about in this two-layer game. Is it really easy to just make that shift back and make it go away and say, ah? Oh, you know what, we, we said all these good things about Trump, we were happy about him getting elected, we told you for years that Clinton was gonna ruin everything, that she was the cause of everything terrible, and, and, and she didn't get elected. But by the way, it doesn't matter, because the American system has just re-equilibrated, and the Congress has, John McCain has silenced Trump, and it doesn't matter at all. But again, there's some tension there, and some contrast with this idea of you know Putin saying, oh, it was good that you, 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 you fired Dan Rather. Right, like, how do we go from this idea of the all-powerful leader to suddenly saying that Trump is irrelevant, right, in vis-a-vis -vis Russia? So I just kind of wonder what the long, I would love to hear more about the sort of long-term lingering effects of the post, you know, the post-Trump euphoria. Yes, things didn't work out the way, but again, we're having this conversation here about things deteriorating, about relations being really bad for the country, almost like, this whole idea that the Russians really sought to have, you know, the, that, that really wanted to not have a particular candidate get elected. That candidate was not elected. The Russians' chosen candidate was elected. Um, and, and does that have any sort of longer term effect on, on this dynamic, on this story we're talking? I mean, Henry, listening to your remarks, I couldn't help but think like, oh, yeah, we could have been having, you could have been saying the exact same thing if Hillary Clinton had been elected president, right? And the title of the workshop was one year after Trump's election. So I come back to the thing that I said, like, did it make any difference? And with that, I'll throw it out to <laughs> open to the discussion. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, sure, sorry. Do you want to take it? Sure, yeah. 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 Okay. Just, just a couple of points. Uh, I did like our workshop very much. The only thing uh, I missed was a kind of symmetry. So I would offer if uh, to work further on our presentations, it would be good uh, to compare uh, one side with other side. Like say, I was dealing with Russian domestic politics and it would be very interesting to uh, compare it to uh, American domestic politics. And one thing which is very important uh, after, after what has happened a year ago is astonishing similarity in some cases which uh, I, I, for example, I would never have in mind similarity uh, between how to manipulate public opinion in one country and how to manipulate public opinion in other country, <coughs> how uh, personalistic regime can be or can try to be in one country and so in other country. And I think Ivan is uh, absolutely right when speaking mm -hmm. about a uh, very long negative effect. And uh, I would say that in my view, we today sounded uh, a little bit more optimistic than the situation is. And the situation is very dangerous. And uh, the fact that public opinion is that easily manipulated means that inertia will be huge. It's easy now to shape this public opinion either with regard to Russia in the United States or with regard to the United States in Russia. But this public opinion will shape politics for uh, years uh, ahead. And before George did explain this uh, uh, well, expression, my, my reading was similar to Russian fables like Sloan and Moiska, like uh, Dog and the Elephant. And uh, in my view and my professional uh, EDFC is time and space analysis. And I would say that in my view, uh, who is uh, the car and who is the dog, uh, or in my case, elephant and the dog differs uh, uh, depending on the scale. At the global scale, it's understandable that the United States uh, is uh, more like a car and uh, Russia is like a dog. In case of Ukraine, it's absolutely different, by the way. And I do remember that in 2013, during our Ponars event, uh, it was summer 2013, we met with State Department guys dealing with Ukraine. And so it was at a time when all these negotiations about association agreements were going on. And uh, I was uh, very much negative uh, with regard to uh, possible Russia's Putin's reaction. Uh, both Ukrainians and State Department ladies uh, who were not very well familiar with uh, our part of the world, 
uh, but very optimistic on uh, the base of the fact that Russia is nothing in comparison to Europe, in comparison to the West in general. It, ha it, it happens uh, very, very differently. And the same is with sanctions. If to look at longer perspective, sanctions are extremely powerful and extremely negative for Russia. But it depends whether rules of the game will be the same. Unlike Volodya, I would e easier uh, imagine uh, unification of Russia and Northern Korea than Northern Korea with Southern Korea. And uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm afraid that the same is with sanctions. Like, say, 2008, Georgia war, uh, Russian-Georgian war, and, uh, well, almost uh, no uh, reaction, not due to stupidity of uh, uh, Western leaders at that time, but due to the fact that uh, financial crisis took place and it did overshadow this. If, for example, uh, American president will decide to act deci uh, well, decisively in case of Korea and will start real conflict there, and uh, the other side is absolutely... Uh, irrational or can be irrational, then uh, if to imagine what can happen there, then all these sanctions, all, the, all these quarrels between Russia and the West will, uh, will be considered to be absolutely ne uh, negligible. So that's why I would say that depending on space and depending on time, uh, prospects can be different. And uh, I would remind you the fact that Putin, unlike uh, almost all American presidents after the Second World War uh, is lucky in many different ways. So he is waiting for uh, the new lucky chance. And unfortunately, perhaps for the country, but fortunately for him, uh, he does have certain grounds to wait for this. Kim? Um, I have some comments for um, several people. Um, for Henry, I think one way of looking at the future way out would be to think about limiting conflict rather than actively cooperating. And those two things kind of get confused. And I had a conversation recently off the record with somebody who had been very much involved in the Obama administration, um, who was saying essentially that you, know, you can't have any cooperation after what Russia did, blah, blah, blah. But that was thinking in terms of these very big moves towards cooperation and not in terms of conflict limitation. And during the height of the Cold War, it was conflict limitation that we were focused on rather than out and out cooperation, and that might help. And just to give a little self-promoting plug, I have a piece coming out in the uh, um, forthcoming issue of the New Republic where I give some suggestions about limiting uh, conflict. Um, to Marlene, um, I think the way that you deal with the elephant in the room is by collecting evidence. And that is what separates social science from conspiracy theory. It's not the theorizing, it's the using evidence to test the theories. And I would say that we have um, really strong evidence on two aspects of what Russia did. And what's really interesting is that they didn't either of them come from US government sources. The first came from CrowdStrike, and it was confirmed by two other firms, including FireEye, and I can't remember what the third one was, um, that the, the GRU, the Russian Military Intelligence Agency, was responsible for the hacking of the DNC. So that is probably pretty close to being a fact. Um, and the second thing that is uh, a fact, because we know it from Facebook and from Twitter, is that there were purchases of what looked like uh, accounts that were not actually accounts that came from this Russian firm located in St. Petersburg. If you go beyond those two sets of facts, we don't really know anything more. But on those two things, I mean, there's just overwhelming evidence that those two things did happen. And that doesn't mean that they necessarily had any impact on the outcome of the election. And so I think as social scientists, it's important for us to keep the evidence and the conspiracy theory separate from each other. Um, to Nikolai, um, uh, we were talking about similarities. I think that one thing that has happened in the United States in the past you know, nine months, 10 months, is that I at least, and I, I would imagine if it's true of me, it's true of other people too, we have been shocked at the level of high level corruption and shenanigans that have become accepted in politics and nobody cares. And I would say that that is a similarity between the US and Russia, that if you told me this a year and a half ago, I never would have thought would come to pass. And I am starting to think about the United States in Henry Hale's terms of having these dual control <laughs> systems. Um, I, I, I'm just shocked that I am thinking about it that way. Um, and then just one final thing that I'd like to say is that um, I'm not afraid of a nuclear war. 
I am terrified of a cyber war. Um, and, and I think that there is a real possibility that if things continue to go on this way, um, that the U.S. is going to suffer because the U.S. is probably much more vulnerable to civil, uh, civilian-based cyber attacks than Russia is, um, to the extent that um, you know, I'm really afraid that uh, Russia could decide at some point, that Putin could decide at some point, to have a major outage of a civilian infrastructure system in the United States, and there's not a damn thing the United States can do about it. Pauline? I'm um, just uh, uh, to react on your uh, saying that you are not afraid of nuclear war. Of course, I'm also not afraid of nuclear war, but bringing up the uh, North Korean issue uh, to the table. I'm not sure, well, I already discussed whether Russia influences North Korea. I think that it's a very uh, indirect influence in the way that Russia showed North Korea. Um, a very inspiring example of a, uh, like a very effective nuclear coercive behavior, how you can do what you want to do in the region, uh, just covering with the nuclear umbrella of your nuclear deterrence in, in this way. And so North Korea now is trying to, to probe this uh, experience, I, I, as I believe. But as for the possibility of nuclear war, recently I heard the like, presentations of my uh, colleagues in the CNS, and they say the interesting thing that, for example, now, if the United States would like to deploy nuclear weapons against North Korea, um, so anyway, um, those nuclear, uh, those um, ICBMs will um, have to fly over the territory of Russia. And in any way, Russia's early warning system will react as if nuclear weapons, I mean, uh, ICBMs of the United States are flying at their territory because they want, uh, like us. And <coughs> the level, or the current level of trust between Russia and the United States today is so low that no one believes that, you know, we are just trying to hit North Korea. And the other point is that even if not ICBMs, uh, but just, um, if to deploy this um, uh, ballistic missile defense, uh, anyway, if um, uh, the current deployment, uh, consider the current deployment of missile defense, so if, uh, for example, some kind of um, ICBM is going from North Korea and, and the United States are trying to hit it, it again flies into the um, radars, uh, territory of Russian radars, and is perceived as the ballistic missile is coming from the United States over the territory of Russia. So in this case, North Korea can become uh, the very <coughs> indirect uh, reason of uh, this um, unexpected and unintentional uh, start of the nuclear war. Well, that's cherry. <laughs> yes. Be afraid. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Josh, I wanted to try and maybe answer your question whether Trump has made a difference. Yes. The point is that uh, the fact. But just to clarify, I know Trump has made a difference. No, <laughs> Trump has made a difference in the trajectory of U.S. Russian relations. It's more focused. What on yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I'm trying to say is that imagine. Okay. Anyway. This year has finally convinced, uh, well, okay, deprived the Russian leadership of any last hope that they have. Because a year ago, so if, if I use the Russian expression, it's the last nail, nail into the coffin's lid of the Russian Western pragmatic and sectional relations. Because ima let's imagine it would be Clinton, and the relationship would be bad, and everybody would. Everybody would be saying, yes, this is exactly what we expected. At some point, there will be a different president who's going to fix it. Now, you've got this different president who publicly has been arguing, still is arguing, that Russian-American relationship has to be fixed and is not doing anything about it. Because he's not able or because he's not willing if we apply conspiracy theory. But the point is, nothing gets improved. And that means that you really have to say goodbye to all your hopes. Because if he cannot fix it, nobody's going to fix it. And if, if nobody's going to fix it, why would Rem Kremlin have to care about some kind of promoting any kind of positive transactional agenda? He has to be preparing for war. And this is what it is doing. Not necessarily a hot war but a very long confrontational relationship. And in that sense, well, anyway, that's, that's, that's how I view it, yeah, yeah. pessimistic view. Uh, I want to quickly respond to that. Um, one thing is, 
Adam Irwitz and I have a formal model which we use to think about protesters in new democracies and whether protests would keep protesting if you protest, overthrow the regime, and then get bet a bad leader. And I've never thought about that model as being applicable in this kind of flipped way, but it's the same sort of argument. As long as you think there's a potential to get a better, in our story it was a better leader, a higher quality leader, you might continue to come out on the street, but you get enough draws from the distribution and you see <coughs> they're all low quality leaders. It wasn't about changing the regime. And this is, it's kind of apropos that, which is interesting. So I'll show you that paper. But I do, I do want to push back on one question on that, which is that Trump was close to taking the sanctions off, right? What prevented that? What prevented that was that the Russians, if we, you know, again, positing everything that we do and do not know, got caught. Now, if you believe it's a total conspiracy, if you believe it's completely fabricated and there was no activity on the part of the GRU or any of these organizations, and this has completely been made up by the U.S. deep state to justify going after Russia, then fine, I buy your story. But, the, but if not, if you think that there were even, we can call them rogue elements or we can call them, you know, we can go back to the, talk about other myths, right? That Russia is a monolithic set of power where Putin says something and everything happens. No, there's lots of stuff going on. But if you believe any of this stuff, then, then doesn't it stand to reason that there could have been a U.S. president who wanted to have better relations with Russia? And that president could have very well improved U.S. relations with Russia if the Russians hadn't got caught with, to throw another... U.S. expression out there with a hand in the cookie jar, right, to the point where they compromised him to the extent where it became such a liability for his, his own party that his own party, you know, couldn't go along with that. that. Couldn't that be an alternative interpretation that would then give a different spin on this, that it's not so much that there was no chance this could ever happen, it's that it was incompetently executed by the Russians themselves by getting in this position where they took the leader who was most sympathetic to them and put him in a situation where it was much harder for him to do. I mean, now this then leads a prior question of why on earth Trump was so pro-Russia to start with and whether that was because he was enlightened and because he realized that we had to do this or there were other reasons why this of all things was motivating Trump, you know, during the course of his election. So I just- There can be a different argument. Let's show his opponents that we can be nasty. So they will understand that we can be really nasty, and that's why they will be listening to his argument that the United <laughs> States should be interested in improving the relations with the United States. <laughs> can I, I can you just also one sentence to kind of maybe also push back on your argument. There are maybe no more hope for the, the Russian side to have a more kind of concern, uh, friendly US president, but I think there are hope for Europe they are hoping Russia for Europe to change its position. And that's going back to what I think Korea was the right point about. They are in time and space, there are issues that will be overshadowing what is happening in Russia. And I think it depends how Syria evolves. If, if Syria deteriorates a lot, then it becomes such an issue for Europe. Then the problems with Russia and Ukraine are kind of on the side. And if a solution is found in Syria, with a certain role for, for Russia, it will also push a lot of European leaders to kind of calm down things in, with, with Russia. And I think the, the Kremlin is hoping for that. I think I, the Kremlin I, is I, hoping I, for... I disagree. Yes. I don't think Syria can deteriorate to such a degree that it will yes. become such a massive problem to Europe. Look it, at Libya. It, exactly. It has deteriorated a lot and so <laughs> what? No, I mean, we had we have this story exactly a year ago. When throughout the fall, for three months, European leaders, were const during the bombing of Aleppo, they were constantly discussing whether and how to react. And the response was zero, nil. They couldn't agree about anything. As compared with Ukrainian situation, where they agreed about sanctions and they stick to it whether they like it or not. They were not able to take any decision, even kind of verbal condemnation was not done properly within the EU con context. Yeah. They can't do it. No, I mean, I, I guess like, I don't think Syria is something which, yeah. which is relevant. But, uh, but uh, on your point about uh, with the hand in the, uh, in the cookie jar, you know, Arkady was saying about the Russian perspective. Yeah. About Russia, and you, what, what you are saying implies that Russian would you know, and, uh, accept the fact that it's their own fault. And they were caught. No, no, no. It's no, no. our and that's impossible. Is there any evidence that would convince 
the Russian public that in fact this happened? I don't think it's about the public. Yes. I know with Russian you public, we, I, do, I, I don't think it really, it really matters. But if it's not about the public, then question. yeah. Well, there's any evidence? Kim, you can't imagine no. this evidence. No. And Putin is perfectly right when saying that. Well, show us yeah. the facts. Do you have scripts of these uh, GRU orders? It's impossible. There no. can be no well, actually, evidence of any time. That, that lead no. to pretty close to it. Close no. to it. If, you, if you go to the CrowdStrike website. <laughs> They go in great detail through all the evidence they have and then all of the things that might come up against that evidence and why they nonetheless believe that the evidence is correct. And I have not seen a single report by any technical person, either Russian or American or anyone else, who goes point by point down the CrowdStrike thing and says CrowdStrike is wrong. Oh, instead, I mean, there's the one guy who said that, that something about the timing of it, but that wasn't going point by point down the CrowdStrike thing. Instead, what we have is FireEye, which is a CrowdStrike competitor, which has a very strong incentive to say CrowdStrike's an idiot, come to us instead for your cybersecurity, to go point by point down what CrowdStrike do, did and say, yes, we agree. Kim, you did already contribute a lot uh, to growing Putin's popularity when blaming Russia for deciding the fate of American elections. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's a very different question. That's a very fight. different question. And I'm asking a serious question. Then Russians will be proud. And for people who do not feel obligated to say something, but who are genuinely open to this question, my question is, is there any evidence that could convince, let's say if something is found in the future, yes. is there any evidence that could convince reasonable people in Russia that Russia actually did do the hacking and interfere in the election? It would or is any, that Russia let me finish my question. Yeah. Or is any evidence that is presented going to be denied because of course Russia couldn't do this? No, we'll think no, it's not not But that the comes from a team. That, that, that's exactly what Clay said. It will yes. make people proud to think that yes. Russia has been able to yes, do that because what you, need, you, what you would need to deconstruct is to deconstruct the idea that the US is not doing the same on the Russian side. Right. So the Russian perception was like, good, we did it because right. they are spending the last 20 yeah. years to do it to us. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so that's not the problem. Language. But if there, but just to make my point, if there was, <laughs> If there is a belief that Russia could do this and did do this, then the next step is if they were going to win the election, Trump was going to win the election anyway without Russia having yeah, done this, exactly. right? Then the fact that Russia went and did this is right. probably actually the reason that the sanctions got strengthened, yeah, right. right? And that clearly reasonable Russians, I think, can see that this has become very toxic in American politics, especially if you want to not blame Trump and, you know, you say this. Anyway, so we have a bunch of other hands. We can keep going on this. We can talk more about this over dinner. Yvonne, did you want to? Yeah, well, and actually, the actually, actually was the, 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 the very last, last exchange was, was about what I wanted to say, that is actually that uh, the, the whole discourse is empowering Putin, yeah. Of the whole discourse that Putin could influence American elections is something that empowers Putin and makes him much more influential in the eyes of the Russian Russian public. So it's it's something which, yeah, and, well, it's, it's already has been said. And, uh, and uh, you know, continue what Arkady was, uh, just said. You know, just to mirror very popular American question, uh, not question, but statement that uh, there is a... Uh, we, what we got is that uh, Russia had not a Clinton problem, but American problem. It's a problem not in a, in a particular politician, but America as a whole. And this is a, you know, this is changing situation. While I'm more more optimistic in the long run as a historian, you know, like <laughs> several decades from now will will be different. Especially but, the centuries. <laughs> yeah, for centuries, yeah. But for the medium medium range, uh, story it will be better. And of course, uh, and all of this uh, this heated exchange uh, which Kim started is uh, is actually uh, made a bigger. Um, you know, on the Russian side, it, it makes it, it's empower also this what about ism and you know it's what uh, actually uh, Marlene, Marlene answered. What about ism? Because uh, one of the answers from the Russian public, educated Russian public, was you Americans did the same for us for many years, yeah. and this is very hard to to, to 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 answer because it's it's something which empowers this uh, argument of what about ism? Why you Americans are getting so much you know 
problem about that because you did for us and for everything, everybody else the same thing. And this is very hard to, to, to this is not an argument that we did not. It's an argument that yeah, we did the same that you did for us. Just very, yeah, yeah, we want to. A Russian yeah. colleague was telling me there was no evidence of this having happened. And I showed the website on CrowdStrike that went through point by point by point. And she had gone on and on and on about there's no evidence this happened. And when she saw the website, she said, Well, you know those technical people, they can get people to believe anything. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like Aud Audrey Simpson trial. You know, Aud Audrey Simpson, you know, those people who believe in the test. Genetic test yes. and those who don't. That's it. Yeah. Right. You cannot convince them. The first speaker spoke about this concept of a stagnation, you know, for a long period of time between U.S. and Russian relations, and it's hard to see where the miasma ends. But couldn't it be the case that the, what's really going on is that Russia and m most of the world is seeing the United States as a deteriorating power? That it's no longer the superpower, it's China's becoming the superpower. The United States is falling into kind of an internal. I won't equate it with the with the Roman <laughs> with the Roman Republic, but by internal fashion fights, so that it doesn't really matter to them whether you're really on the Democratic side or the Republican side. What matters to them is that the United States is almost by its own volition internally stabilizing itself. So therefore, if you're trying to then construct a foreign policy, the foreign policy you're going to orient to is where you see the future is, and the future is clearly going to be in Asia. It's going to be how Russia deals with China and both the opportunities and the threats of China to Russia, and also to see the world in a non, you know, dichotomous relationship between the United States and, and Russia, and, and sort of screw all the Americans who think they're important by blabbing on about John McCain and sanctions and who stole the election. And so what that means is that you then put Europe into play, and primarily Germany into play. And it's very interesting that the Russians didn't, you know, there's no accusation of the Russians trying to quote unquote destabilize you know, the German government, because the German government's very important to them, and German industry is very important to them. So what I think is happening is, is that America is becoming more and more irrelevant, except to Americans who think that the America kind of can just kind of, no, <laughs> that's, it's this like uh, Punch and Judy show with the Americans. But what the Russians and other people are looking at is the whole Eurasian developments in the third world and things like that. So that's where I, I kind of think it's happening. I don't think it's going to be a, 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 just a, a stagnation. I think at least the image until the United States reverses this is that America is in decline. Henry, do you want to well, Let's get a few more. Okay, yeah, and then, all right, then I can yes. respond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, the question was, could U.S. Russia relation get worse in regards to Syria? I think you should generalize it to the Middle East altogether. And interestingly enough, nobody mentioned the fact that the relation between Saudi Arabia and Iran yeah. has got worse in the last two, three days, actually. Okay. Yeah. To the point where uh, Iran is now threatening Saudi Arabia directly and quite worse. When you think that the United States now supports Saudi Arabia to some extent, and Russia supports Iran to the other extent, the possibility of a general complication in the Middle East has got much worse. So that's regarding the Middle East, and nobody has mentioned this thing yet. Secondly, regarding North Korea. Uh, Putin would like to appear in his meeting with uh, Trump in a few days that he's the necessary interlocutor in terms of solving the North Korean problem. <coughs> the problem is Russia doesn't have any levers, any levers to influence North Korea. It used to have lots of levers uh, until the Soviet Union collapsed when there were no relations with China on the one hand and Russia was the main supplier of equipment, economic aid, and technology to North Korea. <coughs> Right now, Russia relations with North Korea, in terms of economic relationship, technology transfer, except for some smuggling of uh, weapon technology, are essentially non-existent. So Putin's levels to actually affect anything happening in North Korea are very small. On the other end, most of the levers are in China's sense. And China, for their own reasons, doesn't want to use the levers that it has. On the other hand, the United States is constrained in any relation with North Korea, among many other factors, by the mere fact that there is a border between North Korea and Russia. And that's a constraining factor. Thank you. Yes? Oh, the gentleman made my point on Iran, <coughs> but also looking at another potential conflict, there's a stronger relationship between uh, Trump and Israel 
and <coughs> Israel is getting very nervous about Hezbollah and the Iranians getting closer to their border. That is another potential conflict, and there's a question of Israel sends missiles, attacks Syria, what would Russia's response be? And the question of both these Iranian and uh, Israeli uh, Syrian questions are, are, could both of those major powers restrain those countries, or if they do start fighting, do we get involved? So we're going to keep, yeah, we're going to keep thinking. Yeah. We have no time, of course, for the Middle East. <laughs> so I apologize. <laughs> uh, but, um, very valid question to ask. Uh, one of the uh, Iran, in fact, uh, why, why the U.S. is relevant to Syria? Uh, one of the three reasons why it's really, in a very concrete sense, it's very highly relevant to Syria is, is the Iran factor. Uh, not just because of the U.S., but it's a common position shared by U.S., Israel, Saudi Arabia, but also genuinely by most Syrian opposition groups including ceasefire groups present in Astana, that for them, they, well, they're fine going to Astana, even despite the fact that it's broken by Iran, but what they cannot accept, all of them, is um, Iran's status as a guarantor with military presence on the ground uh, in Syria. Now, one of the uh, most, uh, uh, more realistic in the long term demands of the Syrian opposition and also of Israel is that actually Hezbollah and Shia militias, the foreign Shia militias, leave Syria, which is one of the conditions for mm -hmm. the deal. And that's going to happen. <laughs> okay? But for that to happen, you need three <coughs> conditions to be met. Because Iran is as much concerned about any U U.S presence on the ground in Syria. As the US, Israel, and others are concerned about the Iranian presence. Yeah? So they, two, you need three conditions. First, you need uh, end of major fighting in Syria, which would make Iranian and pro-Iranian militias role on the ground less uh, needed. You know? uh, second, um, uh, you need to, uh, 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 Iran's influence in Syria uh, beyond and apart from direct military presence uh, needs to be somehow secured. They need to be assured that they keep enough influence even without Hezbollah, Shia militias, and even Iranian direct uh, presence. And third, uh, any such withdrawal should not look as a victory. <coughs> it's very important to make it not look as a victory, outright victory for Israel or the United States. Which is one of the reasons people were so pessimistic about you know, there's nothing we can cooperate on. You know, there are issues. Uh, Russia has found a very elegant solution to this entire controversy regarding Hezbollah. It has uh, been closing eyes on Hezbollah, uh, on Israel attacks on Hezbollah forces in Syria. It has just uh, agreed with Israel to extend the buffer zone in Syria, free from Hezbollah on the border with uh, Israel. But it gets nervous when Israel hits occasionally Syrian government forces. And there are other leverage. You know? Even uh, I would go as far as saying that, you know, even a perception, an illusion, not a reality, but an illusion of any one of the ports of continuing dialogue between Russia and the United States on Syria is that even an illusion of a potential backdoor deal behind Iran's back becomes a leverage on Iran. So in real world, when I'm listening to all this pessimism, it's really when, when we get to practical conflict management, Afghanistan, Syria, other places, you know, there's so much going on in real life that actually contradicts many of this uh, the rhetoric and so on, and consultations do go on, and uh, multiple tracks, and uh, things are being solved. And uh, so I'm slightly more optimistic when it comes to practical problems, especially beyond also with Eurasia uh, or U.S. domestic politics. Okay, Alexa. 
it's partly in response to your question, partly in response to Do you want to, can you introduce yeah. yourself? Uh, uh, um, uh, I'm, I was trying to summarize, I mean, there is no uniformity, of course, I mean, but just kind of like get some kind of very rough summary of what the Russian view would be on uh, US-Russian relationship like one year after Trump. Uh, so if people kind of uh, correctly said that kind of had Clinton been elected, they knew the relations would have been in a bad situation, and then you would have been sitting here in this room discussing how we can possibly improve it, but they would have, have turned that in a predictable way. So Clinton was a kind of a known thing. Uh, Trump was not as much euphoric about him, but he was a wild card. It's clear that he would have changed the rules of the game, but in a kind of unpredictable and, and risky thing, and, but nobody could predict in which way kind of the, game, the, the rules of the game would have changed. Uh, and, so, uh, uh, and that sounds uh, a year after, so, uh, it's sort of possible to see how the rules of the game have changed. And in this sense, uh, I'm actually not sharing the optimism. Uh, but say, uh, the, kind of the po one possible Russian view is that uh, the Trump election had put US political establishment in a dysfunctional state, in a state of irrational paranoia and uh, uh, using Russia as a bogeyman. And as long as the United US political establishment <coughs> continues in this state, uh, no meaningful discussion, settlement agreements are possible. Uh, they would make some gestures. They would say, yes, we would want to cooperate here, there. We'd like to try to come to terms. But essentially, uh, it's not that US is not treated seriously in a long-term decline, mm -hmm. uh, but in the short term, it becomes such an irrational, dysfunctional state that it cannot be a negotiable partner. Uh, no possible agreements would be entrusted. Uh, and in this sense, kind of their possible attitude would be just to sit and wait. Uh, so if the US managed to solve its own problem, a political internal political one, and get into a sane state, uh, then kind of a different sense of state would be open. Uh, so they still prefer bad relations to the US, and they, never, they don't underestimate the United States in the sense. And this, it's not that they're casting their law with China. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, uh, but temporarily, and if they, I don't think there is much hope at the moment that any kind of irrational attitude or so anything that Russia could possibly do in is not going to help. That's that's that's, no, kind of, help. Yeah, that's so kind of, uh, until the US political establishment kind of uh, fought its own battle kind of uh, and and within itself. I would just say that in that context you can still do a lot of very practical things, such as negotiation on Afghanistan, certain Deals mm -hmm. with you know with usually with, with yeah. Israel and mm -hmm. Hezbollah and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That well, they're all that, 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 that it's actually a very sort of pragmatic, mm -hmm. very obvious mutual self-interest policy. Mm -hmm. But the grand strategy is you can have a grand strategy if one player can sort of get yeah. it back together. Mm -hmm. Artemy, do you want to? Can you introduce yourself as well? Uh, yes, my name is Artemy Troitsky. I'm a journalist and a writer, not really an academic. Uh, but I may be considered uh, nearly a local guy because I'm partly based in Moscow. So I would like to say a few words on the unanswered question about Russian youth. Well, I think Alexandra asked me about that. Uh, so the case uh, with Russian youth at the moment is that uh, for quite a long time it's wallowing in a deeply rooted schizophrenia. The uh, impact of American, American soft power on Russian people and Russian youth in particular is very underestimated. Uh, in Russian movie theaters, you have 90% Hollywood movies. The most popular TV series, again, are The Game of Thrones, uh, House of Cards, <laughs> and so on. Hugely popular. <laughs> Uh, if we talk about uh, music, it's it's even a worse case because uh, because like you've seen a patriotic Russian singer named Gleb Karnilov, right? So first he was wearing a diesel T-shirt, <laughs> second he was playing a Fender Stratocaster guitar, third his whole song was a spoof uh, of of American rock songs, you know, with all the riffs stolen from uh, from those songs. So I think I think that uh, Russian youth is not hopeless at all. The the new uprising of Russian teenagers in uh, in 2017 is a very good uh, sign of the fact uh, that the new generation is utterly different from the old generation. 
I think that the generation of the notice was completely lost. I mean, the, the most talentless and stupid and co uh, conformist generation of all I've seen, and I've been there while well, I'm 62, so, so I knew the generations uh, for many decades. So, so the brand new one is, uh, is quite promising. And uh, of course, it needs uh, further research. And I think that academics and scholars, you know, should really get down to it because, like, I spoke with people from Levada Center, who've made uh, a survey with uh, Timothy, and and ask them, and ask them these in April. And I, my question was, could you predict that something like this? Uh, something uh, of the kind of what happened in Mar on March 26 would happen and they said no we you know we had abso absolutely no evidence no facts no suggestions that uh, things like this might happen and we are as surprised as as anyone else so it's an interesting uh, an interesting topic and finally I would like to just to share a couple of, of very obvious uh, uh, observations on the main theme of the of the conference today which is US Russian relations one year after so on uh, on the Russian side I can say that uh, despite America is as demonized by Russia uh, in the mass media as as before the attitude towards Mr. Trump in particular is still very soft very tolerable I mean, they can say awful things about America, about NATO, this and that, uh, <coughs> but they never touch Mr. Trump. I mean, Trump is now, I think he's like the avatar of, of Mr. Putin in, uh, in Russia. Uh, it's on uh, the Russian side, on the American side, of course, uh, the obvious thing is that uh, Russia is again for the first time since Perestroika is on the map of, of, of American mass media. And I do take uh, Ivan's explanation that this is happening because, uh, you know, America uh, faces its own problems and uh, sees Russia as a scapegoat. But I would say that the reason uh, is not only this, but, but also the fact that America probably intuitively feels that a lot of pe uh, things and issues very typical for Russia are now starting to happen in America full scale, like political incompetence, corruption, amount of lies and hypocrisy in the mass media, and general awfulness of a scapegoat now becomes a America's very own thing. And maybe, therefore, America is putting much more attention to Russia as a blueprint of what might expect America in the foreseeable future. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, Misha. Uh, I just uh, think you know when we when we think about um, what could a conference look at uh, when it's two years after, or three years <laughs> after, or four years after. What kind of things that we haven't looked at and might be worth thinking about? The value of the discussions like that. Maybe they flesh out what was left out. And one of the things that I thought about was that there is a constant in this first year. Trump remains uh, the negative, uh, the uh, nagging knob of negativism, <laughs> uh, characterizing other people, especially in tweets. And yet he has never criticized Putin yet. In not a single time, I don't think. He remains that kind of, you know. So what is then, the, the larger question, what is then the source of Trump's motivation toward Russia, you know, uh, and and you know, is it civilizational? Is it geopolitical? Is it personal, financial? Uh, they, these, I think, would be something that maybe we will, as we discover more of it, maybe we will be able to understand the continuity and change forces a bit better. Yeah, I guess one of my challenges here, the dilemmas I see, is that. And, and echoed, I think, with a number of comments, and I think Kim and Katharina mentioned it, is that I think the opportunities that exist for cooperation 
are really about damage limiting, conflict avoidance, or nuanced diplomacy at best. In the US now we have institutional constraints on the executive. And so our policies are going to have, our signaling is going to have to be very nuanced and uh, almost by omission, by not enforcing sanctions, by not doing certain things. The, pr the problem is, is that that's occurring at a time where in our domestic politics, that those nuances get lost in the nature of the, the types of, uh, of, uh, of problems we have. And so that's the dilemma to me. Uh, and, but the reason why I guess I'm not uh, overly pessimistic is that the current agenda, it seems that ultimately our strategic interests are still asymmetrical. Where it really matters to the Russians, it doesn't as matter. Even though we bark, our bite is not so great. We don't have an interest in pushing forward. We may not have a clear strategy as well, as somebody mentioned. But as long as those interests remain asymmetrical, I think there's a, you know, the hope is that we can get out of this period domestically. Uh, but the risk, of course, is that those interests become, something else happens, North Korea or something like that. But, but in those cases, our interests may actually become symmetrical. And we may be able to deal with those problems. But the problem, I think, is that the current agenda is littered by asymmetries. Uh, and the, the, the opportunities for pragmatic uh, diplomacy require nuance that our, our domestic situation does not allow. And so if we, you know, the hope is that our domestic situations are going to change, either, both with the, the Russian election and then the midterm elections and whatever happens with the, these investigations. Uh, but there's probably a hope that we can hold the fort. This is, of course, a very suboptimal <coughs> outcome that I was mentioning. But in terms of the, the apocalyptic nature, I think that I, I'm, I'm a little less fearful of that. Uh, the other reason why is I, don't, I think the leaderships generally are opportunistic, not risk-taking. And so changing this situation is going to require some major exogenous shock uh, that could converge our interests internationally and hopefully domestically. Arkani, you had a hand up before. Did you want to? No? OK. All right, so let me turn it back over to my <coughs> panelists to wrap up. Yeah, so maybe we could just wrap up. Yeah, I mean, I don't have any grand concluding comments. But I mean, I guess I would just inter interject that, uh, you know, kind of, I mean, there's a lot of research on beliefs, right, belief formation. And one of the findings is they're highly resistant to facts. Um, and uh, you know, we, all, we all think of ourselves as rational, but in fact, you know, kind of the way the brain works is, you know, you have lots of considerations in mind, and we're highly susceptible to being cued at certain moments by certain considerations that, that happen to be in the in the air. Um, and uh, you know, we're we're and kind of beliefs form based on kind of emotions that form very early on in the process that may kind of cue certain beliefs or kind of activate certain beliefs that make it very hard for beliefs to change. And, um, you know, there's even some research that finds that people motivated to find facts, right, to motivated to, to determine ac uh, accuracy and to think deeply about it, in fact, wind up accessing their own prior views because those somehow feel more comfortable or true. Um, and that the, the best way to kind of counteract, uh, you know, to, to counteract this is, uh, you know, it's when somebody you don't expect to have a particular view or, or you expect to have a, an interest against advocating that view, in fact, advocates it. So, you know, I think that's one reason why we see the shift, uh, you know, towards Russia, right, among Republicans is partly because they were totally not expected to do so, but then you suddenly have Republican leaders saying, okay, you know, it's all right. Um, and so I think that's a more powerful cue, um, you know, and you see the opposite thing happening among the Democrats. Um, and I, I just kind of coming back to one of Josh's points, I mean, I guess I, 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 I don't think, I don't think Putin will be too disillusioned about, uh, you know, what happened in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, what, what the election showed was that um, Russia is not a deal breaker for electing a president, right? A, a pro-Russian policy, you can still get elected, whether or not they did it, um, you know, but it was close enough that they could make a difference. Um, and, uh, you know, whatever it was, Americans were susceptible enough to buy this stuff that was kind of put out there uh, for them. Um, and, uh, and after... Trump was elected, right? You saw a, a surge, you know, a, a, or a significant leap in pro-American sentiments in Russia, you know, at least initially, you know, which is also interesting. Um, and so, you know, that actually lends, you know, kind of gives me some cause for optimism as well. You know, not there's so much we can do about it, but 
um, you know, I, I wouldn't rule out that there could be, you know, kind of as a, a new unpredictable move by, you know, the, the regime, by Putin to uh, try and, you know, freshen up or come up with something different, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, more pro-Western turn in the future, just to liven things up, because I think there would be a, a resonance that could be generated among the Russian population that you'd see, right? You know, just to, just as you could generate anti-Americanism, I think there, I think it could go in the other direction more than people often think it could. Um, again, I wouldn't predict that as being likely, but uh, but I think there are these possibilities for um, improvement. Um, so maybe I'll just leave it there. <laughs> I won't say anything. <laughs> you <benefit. laughs> All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a couple. Uh, I want to make a couple comments and. As one of the people in Ponars who primarily does mass political behavior, I want to make a, just a few comments about uh, on that aspect of things. To so take the Russia hat off and put the, mass, the political science mass political behavior hat on. Uh, first thing is, and Henry's things about um, the facts and people's problems with facts. Just I want to just add a couple more things to this. But yes, this is a huge problem, and this is for. I also work. I work on social media and politics, and so I'm involved in seven thousand conversations right now in conferences about disinformation. <coughs> And, and disinformation spread online. And there is a real issue here with the sort of gut reaction of experts is, oh, if something's wrong, tell people the truth. And there's been a lot of really good research that's done in political science about coming out now about just how hard it is to correct people's misinformation on facts. Um, and it actually, it, in some ways, it's worse than Henry said, because if you tell people an, an, an opinion that they had, they heard something, you tell them, that, no, here's the evidence that's actually incorrect. If the original opinion goes with their partisan persuasion, it turns out that the fact checking, giving them the facts, can actually make them believe the first thing even more than they did previously because what it serves to do is remind them about the thing that they heard previously that already accorded with their views and the emphasis. Um, but two interesting things about this, I will say. Like, one, in addition, uh, Henry's thing about this coming from a source you don't expect it to come from. Two other things. Um, one, where, one place where we often see this is asking people about the state of the economy. You ask a bunch of Democrats about the economy right now, they'll tell you it's terrible. You ask a bunch of Republicans about the economy, they'll tell you it's fantastic. But it turns out there's some new work, which is, I know people have some questions about it, but there's some new work out there showing that actually if you pay people to give you the right answer, they'll give you the right answer. So when you monetarize incentive people and say, instead of just saying, is unemployment too you know, high, and then all the day, oh, it's high. You say, I'll give you a buck if you tell me what the unemployment rate is. People get remarkably more accurate about this. The second thing is, so that's an interesting development, which is an optimistic thing on this, oh, people don't know these things. The second thing is that when Henry said this thing about coming from an unexpected source, another thing, there's been some really interesting research um, by Brendan Nyhan, uh, among others, but also uh, the ad research by Adam Barinsky, Jason Reifler, finding that if you, if you give people when correcting facts, if you give people an alternative explanation for something, that actually helps as well. So to just say, like, there's a politician who, a rumor comes out that the politician resigned because they were caught in an affair. And if you just say, no, they didn't actually have an affair, it's been found out that that original story was wrong, that doesn't do nearly as good as updating people as when you tell them, actually, what ended up happening was they got caught taking a bribe and they had to resign because there was a corruption scandal, then they'll update off of no longer thinking that they had an affair. So that's kind of an interesting finding as well, too. <laughs> Second thing, on Colia's point, um, originally about like public opinion being a barrier to this, um, public opinion is always remarkably malleable. Um, there's a whole sort of theory of public opinion that's, uh, that's, that's still, uh, uh, all these days, after three decades, sort of the dominant theory of public opinion in political science, which is that public opinion is most people don't have fixed issues on, on, on a, uh, fixed opinions on lots of political issues that we as experts think about all the time. And you can theorize about the answers people will give to survey questions that has to do with the last thing they've heard and where, how it conforms with prior beliefs and things like that. And I have been, as someone who buys into this, I've still been stunned <laughs> about how malleable public opinion has turned out to be in the aftermath of these elections. And if I'd known we were going to get this, I'd show you slides right now. But like Republicans changing their views on free trade. Free trade was like a cornerstone of what it meant to be a Republican for decades. And then wham, Trump gets elected. And all of a sudden, majorities of Republicans are against free trade, which makes you wonder whether people even had an opinion on free trade to start with. Democrats. Wham, the election happens, all of a sudden Democrats love the CIA. 
right? Because it's the yeah, I mean, and like this is you know you go back to the '70s and tell my parents this, they have you know they have a heart attack about this. But like, but so so it's incredible how much people change and how much they cue off of things. So on the one hand, it's a bigger problem than you think because people's opinions are so malleable. But on the other hand, this story that like anti-Russian sentiment is in the public is a block towards elites changing their behavior. I think is overstated. Uh, somebody said something about uh, Adam. You were saying like we need. You know, what we really need is nuances. Like, there's there's never been a situation where the public understood nuances in, poli in politics. I'm talking so, about strategic so, bargaining. Yeah, yeah. So this is, a, this is an elite level story. Like, I think nuances always, always get lost. And then one final thing, because it's been, it's underlined a lot of the discussion here, and especially the sort of discussion we've had right now about, okay, so did the Russians, you know, what is the consequences of thinking the Russians influenced the outcome of the election? What is the beliefs about whether the Russians influenced the outcome of the election? What does this mean from a US perspective? What does it mean from there? As someone who works with, um, you know, who, who works in the quantitative analysis field, one way of looking at this election is that it was so close that you, anything and everything could have influenced the outcome of this election, right? That this is a really hard election to ever say what influenced it because from a statistical sense, it was a coin flip. And if we ran the election 100 times, Hillary probably would have won 40 of those times and Trump probably would have won 60 of those times. Or maybe the statistical models we had the first time were actually right and Trump would have won 30 of those times and Hillary would have won 70, but we got the draw. You keep doing these things, eventually you get the draws from this. But like. We can pin causal influence on the weather. I'm sure we can run models that show if the weather was different, the outcome would have been different. I am, I've seen stuff on the Comey letter, right? Like if Comey doesn't release the letter, things are differences. So anything that we're gonna talk about, this question of whether the whether whatever, and we can take the word Russian interference out of it, whether the doxing of Podesta's emails influenced the outcome of the election, did they cause Trump to win? Sure, because everything, when it's this close, everything can have that tiny little marginal effect. And we won't be able to rule out that things didn't have that marginal effect, and we won't be able to rule out rule in that they did, but that's just, good. there's a statistical problem to this. And so I agree with Misha's point that we will know more a year from now. We will continue to know more about, about interesting relationships surrounding this. To me, the biggest question is, how on earth are you the insurgent candidate who is upending the party's positions on free trade, on immigration, on all these nationalist elements and you show up at the Republican convention and you have one thing you wanna change in the platform and it's good, it's about immigration. No, it's about the wall. No, no, it's you wanna change the position on Ukraine sanctions. That made no sense at the time. It continues to make no sense. We will have more answers on that. I think. Yeah, it continues to make more and more sense. I'm sure we'll have more answers on this, but don't hold your breath on ever getting a definitive answer about whether anything turned influence the outcome of this election because it was really, really, really close and it's going to be really, really hard, I think, in that framework because we're not going to be able to falsify that anything didn't impact the outcome of the election, right? Um, so anyway, so those are just a few sort of political science -y comments on it. At this point, I think it's 6.30. I think that gives the members of the Ponar seminar, the members of the Ponar's group who have come here who are joining us for dinner, just enough time if you want to go back to your hotel and drop stuff off and meet us for dinner at 7 o'clock. Um, it may not give you enough time. You can also head, head directly to the restaurant from a logistical standpoint. Um, and, uh, and it gives me an opportunity to thank everybody for coming out today. Thanks once again to Henry and Marlene. Thanks so much to Heather. Thanks all of you for coming.